Hey everybody, I'm Captain Tommy Scoble and you are on the lifeboat. Welcome back everybody. Um, if you somehow missed the last one, uh, Reese was visiting the lifeboat a couple of days ago and we started to talk about, um, well, we started to talk about Reese's past. You know, we've done a lot of stuff on the boat where we, uh, we clown around a lot, but this was more, uh, more serious. And uh, as I said, I think the last time that, uh, that we did this, Second gens have been interviewed a bunch. Um, and I, I sort of backed away the first time from asking her a lot of the questions that people tend to ask every second gen. And then I realized that most of you haven't heard any of those questions either. Uh, so there are some things I think that, uh, that people are more interested in, Reese, that get back to sort of the nuts and bolts and sort of the chronological uh, order of things. So if we could kind of start at the beginning a little bit. So you're second generation, which means you're born into the uh, the cult, yeah? I think that's what that means. Okay. So I remember coming online, right? Now I have a slightly different memory um, than others, but I remember coming online at about three. There are, there are things that I remember pretty uh, pretty solidly from that point on, and, uh, and that's about where my memory starts. Do you remember at what point you started? Uh, what are your earliest memories? I don't know why that just reminded me of the silence of the lambs, but that's one of my favorite movies. And that's what he says to Great Clarice. Uh, one best picture. Um, my uh, earliest, I, I, Tommy, I think I was four, could have been five. Mm -hmm. um, what we talked about the other day, my earliest memories are, are doing uh, training routines in the church of Scientology uh, in Omaha, where there was no church of Scientology. So we, we practiced at home. Um, and studied the works of L. Ron Hubbard at home. And um, it was very structured. And um, my father would put two chairs facing each other. And my sister and I would um, do the training routines every day. Outside of you and your sister, did you have friends? Did you go outside? Did you kick it with people? I mean, did you have children that you hung out with? I'm trying to picture the childhood of, uh, of, you know, someone in as a second gen. Were you hanging out with other second gens? I mean, did you have friends that you kicked it with or was this just isolation and L. Ron Hubbard training? I had a bike. I remember really loving to ride my bike. And in my baby book that my dad wrote, he said that um, I would wear out like he had to buy all kinds of new bikes because I would like wear out the tires and I loved riding my bike. Now I did not, I was not close to my sister. She was four years older and I um, had um, a cousin that my, that was the same age as my sister. And those two were like best friends. And um, I did not see my sister very often because she was over at the cousin's house. And so I was kind of off doing my own thing, riding my bike, but no, I didn't really have any friends kind of, kind of goes with today. I mean, I, I have a ton of friends since having a YouTube channel, but my entire upbringing, I have not been a woman with friends. I just don't do friends. I haven't had friends. Uh, you say you don't do friends. Do you think that that's unique to you, Reese, or is this um, something that uh, a lot of second gens, because to me, and, and maybe again, it's, and I think to a lot of people, it's a fascinating concept. And I don't mean this disrespectfully, but we all know that your dad's a nozzle anyway, right? But to be able to say, you know, I think a Spanky, I'm looking at him, right? And I remember him as a kid. To be able to go, all right, well, that's a that's actually a fully formed, you know, adult human creature there. Uh, to me, that's a concept that's so freaking hard to wrap my brain around that I'm trying to put together what how a childhood looks when your parents think you're basically an adult. No dolls. I mean, what... How about toys? You had a bike you really liked. How about how about things like toys, bike. dolls? Did you do any of these things? Stuffed animals? Yes. Yeah. No, I really, I was just thinking of that. I had a stuffed German shepherd named Butch that my mom got for me. Um, I still have him actually. That, and um, I don't know about dolls. Probably. I name, mean, I would. Did you name think, Butch? I did. Okay. Um, probably because I'm so girly. I mean, I love fashion and stuff like that. I probably had dolls. I don't remember any of that. Um, 
the 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 bike thing i think was more of like a test because when i go back and read this baby book it's really sick how much my dad my dad wrote this book right and he only wrote one and it was about me but he wrote about my sister in it and you can tell and and my sister knows this my mother knows this he did not like my sister from the moment she was born he was very disappointed in um how little she had confront on the universe is how he put it. So she took forever to be born. That was very disappointing to him. It's that, you know, it's just, and then she was born blue, like totally blue. She has terrible asthma. So she was born with problems. So she already was born pulling something in. She had problems. She was already kind of a lower subhuman to him. I was born in 45 minutes. And he writes specifically in this book, man, kid, like you're already just better than your sister. And he says that, and he says, you're ready to confront the world. You've got high confront. You didn't, you weren't born with any health issues. You didn't pull anything in the moment you got here. Um, and then he goes on on my bicycle and he's like, I love your ability to confront, um, the messed universe, which messed M E S T is matter, energy, space, time. It's just your physical environment. So he'll, he'll admire, cause I would fall off my bike all the time and come home with skin knees and I had to get stitches. And he was like, you're such a tough girl on, you know, confronting the universe and your confront is so high and LRH would be proud of that. And your sister, oh your sickly, God. you know, he wrote that your sickly poor sister who's, you know, got all these problems she pulled in. So I don't think I had dolls. I think he purposely had me doing things like we had to do a lot of like pulling weeds outside and like he had us doing weird stuff we were doing what's called lower conditions which means you're in ethics you're in trouble we had to do that a lot when we were little and um it was almost a test for him like look at reese she can confront the the her environment you know she's got and then her sister brianna is such a weakling i mean he would say that you know like i'm so disappointed in how weak your body is why can't you get your body you know more up to speed and he would say things like that all the time Honestly, it's, I, I almost said fascinating, but it would have been such a, a terrible thing to say, but it's, uh, it's really hard to wrap your brain around. I, you know what I mean? I'm not, I, I never won parent of the year. You feel me? You know, I, uh, I, you know, my story, right? I went away for a really long time, but man, there wasn't a moment, right? That the, this, uh, this cult literally can beat maternal instincts out of a human being. Any idea how hard that is to do? Like this goes back to the dawn of creation. You know how hard you got to jack a person's brain up to make somebody unable? I'm sorry. That is just, to me, that is absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, Stacy said my dad was like that and we weren't Scientologists. I, I, I can't imagine it. I really can't. Uh, so the cadet org, you said this was uh, this is the precursor to the um, the Sea Org, correct? It is the Sea Org. It is the Sea Org for children. The Cadet for Org children. is for the for the children. Yeah, and so the parents would go into the Sea Org, and then the Cadet Org was for the kids. But it's not like you're dropped off at and, and as they're going in in the morning, you're dropped off uh, on a permanent basis. Yes, correct. When you're living there. Yeah. And how old were you when that started? Seven. So what would be second grade? Correct. All right. And this is the point at which you um, separated from your mother. Yes. My mother right. left when I was six. Six of the year before that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no mom there for facts of life. There's no mom there for this is what it, this is what's coming ahead, right? All of these things that it means. How does that work out? I mean, is there a, so, is there a, a mentor? Is there a good freaking Lord? How does this work? I mean, it's, it's as clearly, I remember it very clearly, but um, so my mother, um, I actually talked to her about this the other day. I said, mom, I would love to have you on my channel. And, and she's just got a lot going on, but she said, maybe, maybe I will sometime, but she was really heavily intimidated by the Church of Scientology. Um, my dad, 
um, I think was very, very verbally abusive to her and uh, she didn't work and didn't have a penny. And of course, you know, as controlling as he was, he held control over all of the finances and that. And um, so she, she did not intend to leave her kids. My mother did not intend to leave her children. Obviously. I mean, I'm very close to my mother now. I love and respect my mother. I don't hold anything against her. Um, I no, think she did. Like your she... father was terrorizing all, all parts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was so alpha. He was so mean and he hated his kids. I think he didn't really have a lot of respect for women in general. Um, but she, I, she, I'm just going to give you this little blip because I just found this out like two days ago. She went with him to do Scientology marriage counseling when I was six. They were not getting along. They were fighting all the time and they flew to Clearwater and they got the marriage counseling. And she said, I don't, I don't want to stay with you. This isn't what I want to do. I'm going to go home. I'm going to get the kids. We're leaving. They gave her two weeks and uh, to gather her things. And that was the plan. And she got home to us. And she said, the second they walked in the door, my dad said, get out, get your stuff and get out. And you're not taking these kids. He totally, of course, um, and I think, again, I think he, I, I, rem I was terrified of my dad. So I can only imagine for her. I mean, he was so mean. He was so scary. Um, there, please. Oh man, that sounded bad, but she jumped on a chair. Um, and, um, so I can only imagine what it was like for her. And so she packed up her stuff and, um, she said it was really, it was, it was a hard story to hear the other day. It was really rough. And um, he was watching her. He was standing over her. She said, oh, I know what he did. Oh, my God. This was just, I said, Mom, why didn't I know this? He, she said, he gave me an hour and he took you kids to like Target or something. And this broke my heart. She said, I, she had this tiny little Honda Accord. And she said, I remember running back and forth out of the house, like throwing stuff into the trunk. And she said the stuff that I was throwing the most was like pictures of you kids. Cause she was like, I don't know what he's going to do. And so she's running in and out of the house. I just can imagine her, her doing this too. It's just so horrible. Um, and he came back with us and he said, you have one hour to be with these kids and then you're out of here. And, um, she said, I, uh, my sister would have been <clears throat> 10. My sister would have been 10. And she said, I was most worried about you, Reese, because you were just, you know, little. And she said, I took you into a room and we were sitting together. And she said, I didn't know what to do. And she said, you were scared. And um, she wanted to take us. And she, she, I remember this very clearly. She got to the front door. He put both of us behind him. He put both of, like, he just, you know, he was standing in front and, she said, I really want to take the kids. And he said, I will kill you if you take these children. You won't take them. So she left. And um, the church called her. Like, she tried to get an attorney. She had no money. She said, I didn't even have anywhere to go. The church called her and said, if you try to take the kids, if you um, move forward with this attorney, you will be declared a suppressive person and you'll really never see them again. So they just really, you know, they use the SP to clear all the time. That's nothing new. So anyway, I just wanted to preface it with that. And then he writes in my baby book about it. He's like, your mom and I are doing great, blah, blah, blah. And the next page you flip, he's like, well, your mom's gone and we're moving to Clearwater. I just put the house for sale and we're going into the Sea Org. So he just flips his switch. And uh, that's what he did. So I, um, you know, it, it was. And, sorry, I want to defend your mom real quick, too, because. It, people get real blurred real quick, right? And this and all of the stuff that this brought on is very, very recent. Um, in the times that we're talking about, they were kicking the crap out of the IRS, right? Seriously, this cult at this point was intimidating the IRS. They were running every major magazine in America that wanted to write a story about them off of the story. I mean, they terrorized people. It was a completely different time than it is now. I can't imagine what your mom went through. So I hope... I didn't come across it all as judging that because I can't freaking imagine. And what you just described, you know, your mom having to, having to pack stuff. Hell of a guy you dad, man. I'd like to meet him. Um, 
So, yeah. 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 And, and it was never about like, I'm keeping these children because they're safer with me because or anything like that. I love them or any of that. Nothing. It was about winning. And he was about putting fear into everybody so that he could be the bully. And the second she left, um, he was gone for days at a time. I mean, he was a big pool hustler and, and he just left us and my sister would go to the cousin's house. So I would be alone like a lot of the time. And um, that was really a freaky time. I remember being so scared that my mom was gone and he's gone. And I just thought, oh, my gosh, this is such a such a big leap to have no parents. So then um, he just said, we're going into the we're going into the Sea Org. And we drove in his 67 uh, convertible GTO to Clearwater. And uh, it was horrific, Tommy. It was really bad. It was really um, we were immediately separated. So I was put into a different division with the kids, my age, my sister was separated from us. My dad was gone. Oh, separated um, from everybody. I didn't see any of them again, but the whole time we were there, I never saw them again. And I, and I, um, I had to use breathing treatments. I had asthma really bad when I was a kid. So my mom would do my nebulizer and my breathing treatments and I had to use my inhaler. Well, they didn't let me use any of that. They wouldn't allow that. And so they may, I, all I remember so much was being sick, like throwing up. I threw up all the time. I remember vomiting. I could not hold anything down. And all I ever wanted was oranges. They just kept bringing me boxes of oranges and I just kept eating oranges. And um, they made me run all the time. It was laps. They made us do the kids. We had to do laps. And um, I'm not sure what that was about. I, I'm assuming because it's kind of military style. Um, and we did a lot of cleaning. You know, L. Ron Hubbard believes in like, you cannot be sitting still. You have to be productive at all times. Idle is a huge problem in Scientology. Um, so we just ran laps all the time. And I had problems with that because I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe. And um, I would run and I would throw up and then I would have my asthma attack and I couldn't breathe. And then I'd go to ethics for getting in trouble. You know, I'd get in trouble for that. Um, so I, I had a horrible time in the cadet order. And you're walking around wondering what you did to bring this asthma into you. Absolutely. Well, not walking around. They put you in a chair and they put you on the cans and say, no, you know, but I mean, that at any given time, right? I mean, oh, at, I mean, yeah, your, I'm your definitely going. It must be what the hell's wrong with me. Why, why am I pulling this, this in? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was just taken off She's my seven, breathing Laura. treatments. I'm sorry. She's seven years old at this point, separated from her family. And as, uh, and as Tommy Bird said, why not seven? Perfect. Right. Ready for independence. Sorry. Yeah. And ahead. I think I would have, I think if I would have had my sister, I think if, well, sure. I mean, we weren't that close anyway. We were not close. I was going to say my breathing treatments, like I was ripped off of all, I did that every night for years. I had to wear like this mask thing. And I, I don't know. I just remember doing it for years and it really helped. And um, they wouldn't let me use it. They wouldn't let me have anything to do with any of it. My dad wasn't there. Uh, I was in a room with like 10 other girls my age. And um, yeah, it was really bad. And then all we did um, was study course time during the day. And then we had to, we were, the kids were in charge of cleaning the kitchen after the adults would eat. So we would clean the kitchen and they would have us run all the time. I just remember running all the time and I was telling people, I was like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And they were like, knock it off. Get back to it. Yeah. They just, yeah. My inhaler. I I remember as a kid, the terror of, of, of asthma. There's nothing in the world scarier as a kid than the inability to breathe. And they took this away from you. I mean, yeah. it, it, I'm not. There's a there's a word that starts with with N that refers to some people in Germany from uh, from the Second World War. And it's honestly, it's that effed up. If you use that name, you get uh, demonetized. But so seven years old. And even if you weren't close with your sister, I would imagine that. Oh, not it would have been nice. separated from everybody. You know what I mean? 100%. When I was that age, my brother and I were not close, but I would have been terrified to be left alone at seven. I don't know what the hell I would have done. Well, I would have no. been super happy just to at least have her around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Some form of, so yeah. Who watches the, all of these seven, six, seven, you know, and eight year olds. Is there, I mean, how, what, what's this environment like? Is there a, uh, is there a headmaster? Is there a, you know, a woman or a man that oversees or just because you're all, 
you know, Little holy adults. form Satans? Or are you just running around doing whatever? Um, no, there was a lady in charge of our course time all day. Her name was uh, Lou Ann. I remember her and he wrote about her in my baby book. Um, and then there were security at night that would do the lights out thing and come around and make sure everybody was in their bunks. And in the morning, room? 10. And there were, uh, in the morning, they would get us up really early and that's when we would all have to run. And then they did white glove checks. And my dad continued that as I came back home from the Sea Org, uh, white glove where they literally put on a white glove. They come and check our room. Everything has to be super clean. Our beds had to be perfect. Um, and just the running. And then we did the course time and then, uh, we would break for dinner. We would eat, the adults would eat, and then we cleaned the kitchen and we did more running. And it was very regimented. Nobody had any time off. There were no days off, nothing like that. No family time. Again, I didn't see my family. I, I did a lot of crying, Debbie. I did a lot of crying. question. Yeah, nobody. But I'll tell you, when I wasn't crying, I was vomiting or struggling to breathe. I just remember being sick all the time there. And I was not a little sick kid. I never had really issues with being sick, but I think adjusting to the climate, I think it was so humid. I couldn't breathe. I had, I still do to this day. I get bloody noses all the time. I would get bloody noses there all the time from the humidity. It was just a mess. I really, uh, yeah, could have used somebody. Okay. So uh, there's 10 people to a room, right? They fought, they got, they, it sounds honestly an awful lot like a, uh, like a low level custody prison. I mean, I'm not joking. That's 10 people to a room. They come by at a certain hour, they turn off the lights. There is somebody that is supposed to be, uh, basically looking after you now. There's no healthcare, obviously. I mean, they, they jumped that at the door. So looking after you means what? I mean, making sure that you have clothing and something to brush your teeth with, um, feminine products when you get to that age, what, what the hell does this mean? I mean, I wasn't there long enough to have the feminine products. Okay. Um, I don't feel, I, I can't remember specifics here, but what I do remember, I don't think it, there was a lot of hygiene going on. I don't feel like we had like a bunch of clothes to change into. Um, I remember being like sweating all the time. Like, yeah, I don't remember being able to shower much with 10 people in a room. I mean, I, I kind of remember being disgusted by the, how unsanitary everything was. And I was so not used to that coming from my house in Omaha. I had my own bathroom growing up in my house. Like my sister and I each had our own bathrooms. And, um, I do recall thinking this is gross. Like I can't just go. And I think also from the vomiting and being so sick, you know, when you vomit for me anyway, I'm like, Ooh, I need to take a shower. I feel dirty. Um, I didn't get to do any of that. When you're sick in Scientology, you don't take a day off. I can remember being on staff when I was 13, 14. And I remember coming in so sick because you can't not go to work. They give you an assist, but that's about it. And I remember having this high fever and I was super sick. And they were like, get off the couch and start cleaning. Get to work. So it's L. Ron Hubbard believes like it, the more productive you are, the higher tone your body goes. High tone means good. So... It's just a belief that if you lay, if you loaf and you lay around, you're going to go down the tone scale and your body's going to get low toned and you're going to go into agreement with the environment. You got to stay productive. So I remember vomiting and they were like, no, 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 no. You don't get to lay around and puke, girl. You got to go clean bathrooms. Right, right, right back to, uh, to your entrance into the, uh, to the, uh, earth and how proud dad was at that, um, a sick baby book. How bizarre. Um, so at what, how, how many years do you endure this? You're lucky you're not dead. I mean, honest to God, just from an asthma uh, attack that could have killed you. Um, I was not there God. for very long at all, Tommy. I was there for, I think about six months. I'm sorry. I've done, I've done six months in, in places like that. It's a long time. Oh, it was horrible. But like you just said, I mean, it could have been worse. I could have been there for years. Um, I, so uh, what, what happened that you left? My dad uh, showed up. He wore a white uniform and he showed up in the middle of the night and um, 
he literally shook me awake and he did this and he said, we're leaving. And we went and got my sister, Brianna. I don't really know how this happened because there was security. And I was so excited to see my dad. I was so excited when he woke me up. I'll never forget that. I opened my eyes and I was like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in months. Like I was so excited to see my dad. And he just grabbed my arm and like jerked me out of bed. And he was like, we're leaving. Shut your mouth. And he still had that GTO. And um, I think it was like two or three in the morning. And we snuck out. And that was such a cool car. And the the seats were black leather. And I remember I was so excited to see Brianna. And we got into that car. And I remember laying in the back seat. She was in the front with him. And I laid down and he put the, I don't know why I get emotional when I think about this, but he put the top down and I remember leaving and I was like, oh my God, the sky, like it's, I'm free. I just kept thinking, I was like, I'm free. We're free. I'm free. I just thought, oh my God, I'm out of here. I'm never going to go back. And And your dad saved you. It wasn't just free, right? Dad saved you. Yes. It was so I'll never forget that moment. I remember, I remember the top, I remember laying down in the top, slowly going back. And I was like, oh my God. I just remember crying for like two hours on that ride. And he didn't know because he was driving. And I just laid there crying. And I was like, I get to go back to school. I get to go back to like people. I don't have to run anymore. I don't have to clean anymore. Um, so he came and got somebody said, Why did he come get you? My father if you haven't figured it out, is a real jerk. And he has owned his own company since he was like 17. He's had his company um, for a long time. So he's been his own boss. And what I gather is he wasn't willing to be in the CEO. He he was not going to stick to a schedule and have people tell him what to do. My dad is super bully alpha type guy. And I'm sure that's what happened. Yeah. That probably makes sense. So you you think that dad just showed up like a knight in shining armor, right? This is yeah. the, top, the top drops. This is honestly maybe one of the greatest moments ever. And you think freedom oh, yeah. and a great oh, yeah. life and all of that. When does reality kick in? Um, I mean, we went back to our house. The house never sold. So I got to go back home to our house. I know, but um, I'm still like, well, no so we, we go no, back no <laughs> okay. and my sister, um, decides that she doesn't want to live there anymore. And she is older at this point. My sister goes to live in Kansas city with my mother and her new husband. And how old was your sister? Um, at this point, she's probably around 12. And okay. so then at that point, I never lived with my sister again. So I was probably around eight seven or eight. And I never saw her. I never, my sister and I are, I love my sister, but I don't know her that well. I don't know her story that, I mean, I text her every day. She's got a beautiful family. I think she's a great person, but we weren't raised together. So it's kind of an awkward relationship and we're not real close. So like, I don't even still, when I text her sometimes, I'm like, should I have said that? I don't know. I, I don't know her as well as you would think sisters know each other. So, um, she left. And at that point I was just, it was just me and my dad for years, for years. And he dated a lot of different women and he would leave for days. He would go to pool tournaments all over different States and come home with big wads of money. Um, and there was a particular place in Omaha called the pool hall. It was a really dirty mafia bar, like just dirty guys. And he took me there every night, every night he took me. Lovely. And it was bizarre because we wouldn't come home to, I would get excited to go after a while, but because it became routine. But I mean, I was like eight, nine, 10. I remember going to the pool hall for years and the owner Mickey was there and he had just gotten out of prison and we would be there till like three in the morning and smoke clouds. And it was wild. My dad would just take me to the pool hall every night. And, uh, I remember all these men like hitting on me and I remember loving it because my dad never gave me attention. So it was like, I was excited to go see Mickey, the owner at the pool hall. Like I just couldn't get enough of it. And so we did that for years. 
And my dad would win a ton of money and he'd show me the big money ball wad that he would win. And he'd be like, come on, let's go out. And he would take me shopping and we would go to dinner. And I just kind of was his little thing that he would take around with me after a while. He kind of started to like me. And then he would disappear for days because he would go to pool tournaments and I had to go to school. So um, it was uh, it was weird times. It was weird. So just left at home, disappear, see ya, and I'll come back after the tournament. Yeah. I mean, he would leave, leave for days at a time. And I mean, I would walk to school every day. So it's not like I needed a ride. Um, you know, I'm not sure. But, I'm not sure that, that, that passes as uh, okay or normal, but that's, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. That's still bizarre to me. Um, so when you and I first started, the first serious conversation you and I ever had um, on a show was because I heard, I was listening, I was lurking, I believe. And I came on because I heard something really stupid that your father said to you that I felt like I needed to come on and, uh, and, and make a comment about. Do you remember that show? Anyway, at what point, here's what I will ask you. Um, so at what point... Do uh, do you and dad start to um, when when is the explosion from dad? So, um, somebody said, "Did your teachers know what was going on?" No, no, I didn't tell anybody anything, and he told me not to. So I knew I knew what I was going to well, deal with at home. That's part of of uh, of the cult period. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's you all a secret. Yeah, it's very secretive. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't talk. Um, so this continued on until, um, I think I said this the other day, I finished ninth grade. Um, and, um, it, he bought me a training, but this was when he kind of started to, I didn't do Scientology quite as often. Once my sister left, I did like little courses you could do from home, but he didn't make me do that training as much because there was no one to do it with. You have to have a, a coach to do it. Um, right. But I, um, he bought me a training package when I finished ninth grade. And I went to spend the summer in Kansas City with uh, two people that were on staff, Liz and Alex Carr. And um, I did this training package and they recruited me for staff. And um, so I, I did, I went back to Omaha to get a few things. And I told my dad I was going to be on staff and he was just over the moon about it because it's all about optics. It's all about status in Scientology. Right. So it's, um, it's one of the reasons, you know, my dad is married for, he's on his fourth marriage and they're all OT8s. I mean, he's very proud of having that status, you know, and he's a silver meritorious donor and he's given millions of dollars. He doesn't, he doesn't do anything in Scientology. It's just the status. So to have a daughter on staff was a big deal. Right. So yeah. So no problem pulling me out of school. I was 13. I was turning 14 that summer. Um, and I became a staff member and, um, you work about 16 hours a day and I remain, you sign a contract to be on staff either for two and a half years or five years. So it's a two and a half year contract or you sign a five year contract. I signed a two and a half year contract. I did not finish that contract. I made it two years before I left. Um, I, I already said this, but I got a boyfriend almost immediately. His name was Shane and he was also on staff and, um, we really liked each other. He was my boyfriend the entire two years. Um, we regularly had sex. We were really into each other. And, um, I'm glad I had Shane, to be honest. I, I, the staff members were not very nice and he was very nice to me. I mean, he really seemed to genuinely like me. I don't, it might've been a twisted skewed, you know, filtering through that kaleidoscope now looking back at it, but my memories of it were Shane was kind of protective and, you know, I couldn't drive. So, I mean, we went everywhere together and, um, he bought my cigarettes. <laughs> Sounds like a gent. Sounds like a, sounds like a real gent. I, I have a question. If you could back up real quick on, uh, on, so you said your dad, your dad is on his fourth. Is that what you said? Um, his fourth marriage, all OTAs. I have a question. How, how did two OTAs get divorced? 
<laughs> right? I mean, shouldn't these people, I mean, shouldn't this be a really easy freaking marriage to keep together if you're masters of the universe? Or do they just decide that, you know what, we've mastered this and we're going on to something new? How's that crap work? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, you know, and honestly, the divorce from the the last OTH, she's since passed away of breast cancer. I talked about her. She's the one who he found out she died and he was like, oh, she'll be all right. She's a good girl. Um, they got, they had an ugly divorce. Like she was trying, she really was trying to take him for all of it. Um, and I think they agreed on like, she got a settlement of like 500,000 plus she got to keep the giant house he bought her in Chicago. So I, again, it's all optics, right? I mean, none of it's real. OTs can't move things with their minds. It's not I've known real. a few. They're so, not moving. Yeah, I knew a couple. They're, they didn't do anything very magical. No, and they're also, <laughs> they get ugly when they get divorced, just like other people. So, uh, I mean, that's a good question. But to tell you the truth, it's not, it's all smoke and mirrors anyway. So, um, he so just how about all and, of the holidays that us, uh, us people that are uh, unenlightened bags of meat walking around the uh, the planet, things like, Christmas and, uh, and, you know, all of these holidays as they're going on, do you, do you, uh, is there any celebration of these? Is there mockery of these? Is there nothing? So as Christmas comes and goes, just another day. Oh yeah. No, not at all. No, you, you work 16 hours that day, just like any other day. Wow. And yeah, guys, to clarify, my dad is not OT8. He's never been OT8. His wives he marries are OT8s. Uh, okay. Nice. So um, he, just, he, he, he goes big. Yeah, it's it, he's it, again, he, he doesn't actually do anything in Scientology. He's donated millions. He's got a huge status there. You know, um, every 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 time a Sea Org member would call me and I was well disconnected from my father at this point. I'm talking about like just a couple years ago. They, you know, call to do interviews with me and ask me why, why, you know, why are you stuck on the bridge? Why are you not moving? Why are you not donating anything they can say? And if I brought up my dad, which I rarely would, or they'd ask me a question and I'd go, yeah, my dad is, uh, yeah. Who's your dad? Gene Wally. What? That's your dad. Like he's a big deal because of the money he's given. Right. So it's just about that. That's all it's about. Kristen says he thinks of his life, his wives as accessories also. Uh, odd. Yeah. Um, so you know where he's at now, right? As far as I know, he's in Nashville. Nashville. Okay. They have a celebrity right. center in Nashville. And then I think he spends about six months a year in Clearwater. They go down there. Unbelievable. Okay. So. That leaves us at you are how old at this point? Well, were you, I think your last question was, how did it go down with my dad? Correct. The blow up. You're how old? I was 16. 16. I was into my and second year on staff. So what was the, uh, what was the straw? So I am proud of you. You're in there. Something happened that you're no longer because you're the love is conditional. This has been real obvious from the first thing that you said that there's no love that that isn't completely conditional. If you're doing this and making him look good, that's great. So what did you do that, that caused that to go? Sideways? And it was conditional. It took me years, Tommy, to realize how I was like begging for him to like me. Like I would I remember it's sick. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm seriously embarrassed to admit this, but I can remember like finishing and completing some big step when I was on staff or a big auditing action or a course. And I remember being like, I got to go call my dad, like hoping I just was really hoping he'd be like, wow, well done. Well done. I mean, it was not even like, it was just such a, like, I was so dying to just hear him be proud of something I would do. Like, I was just like, wait till my dad hears. And then it would ne it would always fall flat. It was never like, Hey girl, I love it. Like there was no emotion. It was always just this like, Okay. All right. Good. That's up stat. Now let's move on to the next action. Okay. Let's get started on the next thing on the next step. Good. Good. Call me when you get there. It was very always like that. And I just would always kind of let him go and like, Oh, I just wish that he'd be like, I love you. I'm proud of you. I, that's what I was, I was doing that for him. So that's kind of a side note, but um, this, this the, is kind of a great question too. You can ask this whenever, but I don't want it to go away. 
Because I think that's a pretty legit question. Um, so in, in the church, you've got tons of jobs. You're assigned to what's called a post, your job. So my post was called the HCO COPE officer. And I was in charge of the ethics of the org. So running a tight ship, um, you have to be very highly qualified to be in that position. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea. But I was in charge of all the ethics files, assigning people conditions and in ethics, which is hilarious because I was constantly in trouble. <laughs> I don't know how I wasn't removed from that post. Stop. <laughs> you, you got in trouble? All the time. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. <laughs> I thought you would have been a fine, a fine Scientologist that fell right in line. Um, I got in trouble no, a lot. I'm shocked. I My mouth I'm got shocked. me into trouble sometimes. Um, I was what's no. called a joker, a joker and degrader. They would show me the reference all the time. I, I forgot to mention I was raised seriously no joke by George Carlin. When my dad would leave, all I would watch was George Carlin reruns <laughs> all the time. I'm talking for years so I think that had an effect on me. And then Scientology tried to get a hold of me and I would uh, not do or say what they liked and I'd get in trouble and I'd have to uh, word clear jokers and degraders. It was a little too silly. Times, yeah, a little um, too silly. I have a, uh, yeah, my favorite, everybody's favorite comedian. Come on, Carlin was fantastic. And when I grow sure my uh, ponytail out, I look exactly. I really do. I'll show you a picture sometime. I look a lot. I was going to say, is picture's fine. I can imagine it too. You don't I, have to do it. I've got a, uh, I do have a, uh, I do have a good, pretty good photo. The, um, there is a, um, a culture for lack of a better way to put it, especially considering who's doing your interview. Um, there is a culture that is a huge part of everything that is Scientology that is just snitching. Right? <laughs> you better believe it. You okay. Better believe it. Yeah. I would know being in charge of the ethics, uh, ethics part of the organization reports come in. That's all they do all day long. It is just, uh, nothing but reports, nothing but telling on the other person. Were um, you doing it? Was it, no. was it so ingrained that, that everybody does it? Do you fake everybody it? does it. Everybody does it. But honestly, I was a bit lazy. Like I didn't want to take the time to write a six page report on somebody that I saw talking to a non-scientologist around the corner. You know, people wrote there, there's a ton of different reports. There's something called an idle report. And that's where you just see someone being idle. Like if you saw someone sitting on the couch, you'd write a report. I never took the time to, I just thought that was such a waste of time. Um, but I also enjoyed smoking. So I thought this is, I'd rather go have a cigarette. I don't want to write <laughs> that somebody's sitting on the couch. Honestly, it's not worth yeah. my time. Uh, um, you know, no, I was not funny. a big reporter, not a big reporter. No, never was never got into that. Um, but there were, yeah, big, 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 like ethics files. My ethics file <laughs> was so thick with reports. So yeah, again, it was that joking and degrading. Um, so yeah, but to get to the point about what, what, what was the straw, if you want me to explain that, I would. um, I said this the other day, but there was a, um, report that was supposed to be sent up lines to David Miscavige and Scientology oh. weeks end every Thursday at two. So a cigarette break was not considered idle. Well, you had to go hide on the other side of the building. So no one would see you, Kristen. But yes, it was idle. But everybody smoked. So that was kind of a, you know, everybody kind of, it was okay. Um, I um, I did not send this, this thing up lines like I was supposed to. And my close, close friend, who was the highest trained guy, he still is in Kansas City and like within four states, Dan O'Connor, super highly trained. Um, just saw him at the uh, ideal org opening in Chicago, like two weeks ago, by the way. Um, <clears throat> he, um, it was his report. I didn't send it by, it was supposed to be sent by two o'clock Thursday. I thought I sent it. I didn't, I didn't do it right. Um, and he came in and um, lost his mind. He, uh, everybody probably knows his story at this point, but he no, picked I'm up sure a fax. A lot of people don't. Okay. Sorry. He picked up a fax machine and he hit me on the side of the head with it. I fell to the ground. Um, and Dan was a big guy. I mean, he was, he was probably like 220. I don't know. And, uh, I was not so big then at 16. I was pretty probably normal weight, you know, just 
not not sitting around eating chipotle like now um so he knocked me to the ground he got on top of me and i remember this lasted like five minutes he hit me in the face he put his he had his hands on my neck and um it was terrifying if i've never experienced anything physical in Scientology. I, I really got to avoid that. I, I witnessed it a lot. There were a lot of fights, guys, lots of fights, lots of throwing things. Um, I avoided that. I never engaged in it. I never threw things. I never hit anybody, but it went on a lot among the adults. And um, he, um, there were some witnesses that came in. I was screaming for him to get off of me. He wouldn't get off of me. Nobody would help me. And when he finally got off and left the room, I locked the door and I called my dad and I told my dad that he had hit me. And my dad said, um, stay there. I'll be there in, in three hours. I feel like I already told the story the other night. So I'm trying to just get through it. Um, you didn't tell here. Okay. Could be, could so I stayed locked. Go ahead. Sorry. I stayed locked in that room. And I just kept thinking how excited I was. It was kind of like that night. My dad showed up and said, we're leaving. was going to come down in the car again. Yeah. And he was so, he had so much intention in his voice when he said, he, I remember him going, stay locked in that room. I'll be there in three hours. Like he was furious. And I, after I said he hit me, he was like, oh yeah, no. And I thought, oh my God, this is so, like, again, I feel saved. I feel like I'm finally going to get out of here. Um, and, um, he called and said, I'm here. And I unlocked the door and I went down the stairs and I remember just hugging him and I was hysterical and I was crying and he didn't want to have anything to do with me. He was like pushing me out of the way. And he was like, get, where is Dan? Let's just go. Where the hell is this guy? And again, I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, I would have rather just gotten in the car and left, but he mm -hmm. wanted to go deal with Dan. And I, I followed him and we went into Dan's office and he got really close to his face and he just said, hit me how you hit her. I want you to show me how you, how you hit her, hit me. And Dan got out the, um, pointed to the reference in the ethics book where L. Ron Hubbard gives a guy a black eye over a knowledge report. And he said, I was applying HCO policy letter knowledge reports. And that's what I did. And it was per policy, what I did to her. And, um, the executive director showed up at that point and said, you know, get away from Dan, it's her. This is who's pulled this in. You know, she's the one who's pulled all of this in. She's a problem. She's been a problem since she got here. And she, I had a non interbulation order written on me. And that was over the guy that I said about, I don't know, a month, maybe two weeks prior to all of this happening. I was in the HCO office. I was turned around and a guy named Tom came in who was the treasury secretary. And he was like 50. He was like 48, something like that. And he flipped me around at this filing cabinet and he shoved me. It was so awful. It hurt. I remember like being in pain. He shoved me really hard against this filing cabinet and he immediately stuck his tongue down my throat. Like that was the first thing he did. And then he started like groping me, grabbing me. And I was so freaked out. I just didn't expect it. I didn't even know it was going to happen. He just literally flipped me around and I reported it. And that's what got me in trouble. I got this non-interbulation order written on me. And that's a pretty Can you big ethics. That just real quick, non-interbulation. Yeah, I was just about to. It's a pretty big oh, ethics. It's a pretty big ethics step when you have that order written on you. It's basically saying, like, you are this close to being declared a suppressive person. And being declared a suppressive person is where you are exiled, you are kicked out of the church, you have to disconnect from everybody. That's what happened to me. So it's a scary order, right? So they post it up everywhere, all over the org. Reese, Reese Wally has a non-interbulation order. Um, and I had 30 days that I could not get a report written on me or I would be declared. So that's the stakes of a non-interbulation order. And it says why I got this order. And it said she has been entertaining the men of the organization. And there's a policy by L. Ron Hubbard that Sex in an org where uh, it's called out 2D. 2D is the second dynamic in Scientology. The second dynamic is the family unit, the rearing of children, and sex itself. So when you have out 2D, that's like sleeping around, being promiscuous, okay? So they posted this thing saying Reese is out 2D in the org, and that brings down organizations, and it lowers statistics, and blah, blah, blah. And I had 30 days and if I had an, any report written on me in 30 days, I would be declared. 
So you can imagine I was tiptoeing around, like trying to do absolutely nothing. Well, I got that order written on me for reporting Tom for what he did. Right. So at this point, go back now to where my dad is there. And she walks in and says, leave Dan alone. She pulled this in. This is her problem. This is her fault. She's destroying our organization. And my dad loves Maggie. He's known her since the seventies. And, um, he looked at me and he said, is that true? Is this true? And I said, I mean, and you have to remember my whole existence and his love for me is based on me walking a tightrope in Scientology, right? So he doesn't care if I saved a baby from a burning building. Like he doesn't care about any of that. It's all based on whether or not I'm doing what I'm supposed to do in Scientology. And I knew that the second he looked at me, I knew I could see the horror in his eyes that I have a non interb order. Like that's the worst thing. My daughter, you know? So I said, dad, and I could just feel, I just felt the fear. I was like, he looked so scary and intimidating. And I said, yes, but hold on. I said, I don't, I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I reported this guy. I said, he grabbed me, he showed up in my office. I didn't, and he was so pissed. He was so mad at me. And he just stood up and he um, he walked off. And um, he went down the first set of stairs. And he got like five stairs down. And he, I said, what are you doing? I said, what are, what are you doing? And he said, I am not your father anymore. He said, do not ever contact me again. Um, disconnecting from you. And I just said, please don't leave. Please don't go. And he said, um, find your own financial way out and uh, don't ever call me again. He said, I'm so disappointed in you and I never want to speak to you again. And he said, do not call me dad. And he left. Um, And that was it. It's uh, it's I have such a hard time wrapping my mind around that, honestly. And I think it's uh, you know, I I have a daughter, and um, my daughter got uh, kind of yanked away from me. And I don't mean because I, uh, because I, I went to prison. I lost my daughter prior to going to prison um, because of the life I led. But it destroyed me. It absolutely destroyed my life. Um, it, it's such a, it's such a statement on the destructive power of this crap. I mean, I hope everybody's getting that. It as horrific as this is, it's not unique. I mean, it really isn't. This is this is the the second gen story, right? It really is. Like you hear this, there the the details are a little different, but it's always the same stuff. It's they they manage to um, over really long periods of time to destroy what Mother Nature has put in us. Things that that literally are in there just get beat out of us. I'm so sorry. I really am. And here's the thing I got, I got to say. Um, I was talking to a couple of different people today um, who are outsiders, so to speak, who watched the show. And I just said, yeah, is there anything you'd ask? And someone said, uh, how is she as positive a human being as she is? And, that, and I promise you, that question was asked before they saw this show. But um, I say, I've said this interviewing other second gens before, by the way, too, you, you would have such a legit excuse to be the most bitter person on planet earth. And you're not. Honestly, I think I was the most. Yeah. It's taken me time to get here, Tommy. I think I was for sure. I think, um, yeah, I, I <laughs> this is the, I mean, I, I'm, what am I, I'm having a hard time thinking what I want to say, but like, I was so angry with him after that. It took me a minute to be angry. I was really sad and depressed. But like, so right when he left, I started peeing blood almost immediately. I went to the bathroom 
I started peeing blood and, um, I asked for medical help. I asked, um, some of the most senior executives and I said, I'm urinating blood. Something's wrong. I need help. And they were like, go F yourself. We are not helping you after what you just did. You know, you just caused a huge problem. Um, so Shane, my boyfriend took me to a hospital and this, this ties into what we're about to talk about, what, what you just said. That's why I'm saying sure. it. Um, I, I went to a hospital and I was there for over a week. I had two different surgeries and, um, I was super jaundiced. And when I got there, the, um, the ER doctor separated Shane and I, and he put me in this room and he said, I have to ask you something. He said, are sure. you using drugs with a needle? He said, are you using needles? And I said, no, I don't do drugs. And he said, you're extremely jaundiced. So I need to make sure that you're not using drugs. And I said, no, I don't even, I didn't even know what jaundice meant. He thought um, you had hep. Hmm? I said, he thought you probably thought you had hep. Hepatitis makes you jaundice. It makes you really, really. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, it makes sense that he asked that then. And, um, oh. so I was super sick. I was in the hospital for over a week and, social services came and, you know, they were like, where's, where are your parents? And, um, I called my dad and he, I, he doubled down. I really, really felt hatred for him after that. I called him in my hospital bed and I said, I'm in a hospital. And he said, I do not care about you at all. He said, don't ever call me again. Don't call me dad. Don't call me. And, um, I ended up having surgery. I found this out getting my hospital records like a year ago. Um, he gave consent over the phone to the doctor when I went through the records. Cause I thought, how did I have surgery? Like he never showed up. He never did anything. He gave consent. I read the notes. Um, so I had that surgery and like, I think within a month, um, I was so hated at the org. I was so hated at this point. I mean, I had caused so many problems. I had to go have surgery when you, you know, when you get that sick, you're obviously a real low, low, you know, human individual in Scientology. Well, you brought in all this. I mean, good Lord, you drew, you yeah. drew in everything. Yeah. So I created this animosity with my dad in the org, Dan, you know, Tom, all this. Like, so I've just created this storm. So I called, um, my sister in Omaha, I have a half sister. She's 12 years older than me. And, um, she came in the middle of the night and snuck me out of the place I was staying in. And, um, we were about halfway to Omaha and she said, I have something I need to tell you. And I hadn't seen her since I was little. <laughs> and I said, okay. And she said, I am, I am a drug addict. And I said, okay. And she said, I do a lot of drugs. And I thought, oh boy, okay, because I'm not even allowed to take a cough drop. So right. I thought, okay, uh, all right. So I was very nervous about what am I about to, you know, just scared. I was really freaked out. And um, the re I'm still going into this story because it ties into what we did again, still with my dad. You're good. This is what I mean. Well, so I got to Omaha, we got to her little one bedroom apartment and she, I mean, I'm happy that my sister came and got me, but she said to me, I was 16 at this point, And she said, you're never going to do drugs. She's a lot like my dad. She's very alpha, very bully type of person. And she said, you are never going to do drugs. She had a, so I was 16. She had a four-year-old daughter living there. That's my niece. Who lives in Arizona now, by the way. I'd like to go visit her sometime. Uh, yeah. She had a four-year-old daughter and um, she said, you're never going to do drugs. You are never doing drugs. And I said, you never have to worry about that. That's the last thing I'm going to do. I just came from Scientology. I'm not doing drugs. I, I, you Truly, you can't take an Advil. And I lived there for about a week. And then she came up to me. I was sitting in a chair and she came up to me with this piece, strip of foil that was kind of bent yep, and a um, V shape. Yeah. And a pen that was emptied out and um, rocks all on top of this foil. And she said, she just put it in my face and she said, you uh, are going to do it anyway. And she said, you're going to do it with me. I don't want to find out you did it anyway. And I said, I I'm not doing drugs. I have no interest in doing drugs. You do what you're going to do, but I'm not doing it. 
And she said, suck when you see smoke. And I said, I'm not doing, I don't want to. I was really freaked out. And she just said, um, when you see smoke, suck, do it. And she hit the lighter and I did it. And um, I was hooked. I mean, immediately, I just, I was absolutely hooked on it. It felt, I'd never felt better, honestly. I was right? like, holy confidence. I just felt so good. Yeah. Your body released all the dopamine it had in its in its brain, probably for the first time ever. Literally everything. That's what happens the first time you do that drug. All of the dopamine that you've got stored up. They do a little study thing, honestly. They say that when a doctor hands you your baby for the first time on a scale of one to a hundred, that rates at about an 81, right? In the release of all of those feel great chemicals. The first time you do meth, it's over a hundred. I did right? not know that. So that's what oh, that yeah. is. It's dopamine. It's nothing. Yeah. Well, it's dopamine. It's a cocktail of about 30 different ones on meth, which is why of all of the drugs out there, it's one of the ones that is the most difficult to, uh, to get treatment to, uh, with people who are really deeply involved because it's not just dopamine, a lot of it, but there are so many things that get released. It's everything. It just goes, ah, it's a cocktail. It's why it ends up being the sex drug. And it's why it ends up being a lot of other stuff. Cause it's, yeah. It's, um, it is a very, very dangerous drug. Okay. I, I didn't even know that. Honestly, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so we, we're in Omaha doing meth for two years and going from house to house. My sister was sleeping with all kinds of different drug dealers to get the drugs. Sure. Um, and they were just in and out of that apartment all day long. And I hate that my, my niece was there the whole time and just random people coming in and out. Um, and to this day, I think what I, I don't know, I don't want to know, honestly, I will never know, but I mean, I would, we did it all the time. I mean, she must've been, she couldn't afford it, but I think she was sleeping with so many people to get it. Um, I would just stay awake for weeks. I mean, I remember just being high all the time. We were just doing it all the time. Where was my mother? My mother lived in California yeah. and, um, and then I would crash I would come down and crash for like a day or two. I would just black yeah. out. And I remember just sleep, waking up. Sleep for days, yeah. I remember waking up in different houses sometimes. Like I and I think what happened to me with all those guys in there? Like, I don't know. I don't want to know. Cause I was 16. Um so um that went on and on, and um it was horrible. And one of the th reasons I quit, I wanted to quit because I I've told you this. I just woke up one day and my eyes were like black. I mean, I had been picking with tweezers at everything. Oh, and yeah. yeah, I mean, I was unrecognizable years later. Okay. I was so yeah. skinny. Yeah, 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 yeah. So thin. And Fox. I honestly do thank Scientology for some things because I think that kind of woke me up. I was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I was a staff member. Like I, I'm, a, you know, I'm not a big deal, but I mean, like I'm an ethical being, like I was like thinking that one day, like, how Correct. did I get to this? And, um, my sister was, she got pregnant by one of these drug dealers. And I remember sitting in this house and she was nine months pregnant, smoking crack out of a crack pipe, like hunched over with this huge belly. And she started shooting and doing crack and I wouldn't do it. Like she kept trying to get me to do it. And I was like, I'm not, I don't like needles. I don't want to do that. And I remember looking at her stomach and I was like, this is, it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. And I thought I cannot contribute to this. I can't be a part of this. Um, I felt so bad in that moment for even being in that vicinity Dirty. in there. And she had no shame. She had zero shame about it. And I just thought, this isn't me. This isn't me. This isn't who I am. I know it's not me. I just know I'm a teenager, but I know this isn't me. Just real quick. It wasn't her either. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but in her own defense, nobody in their right mind does that. That's what drugs do, right? You're not in your right mind. It really is. It takes people. I promise you, if you people knew me 12 years ago, there wouldn't be four of you watching this. 
he wouldn't have liked me. Drugs make you do things that, and, and I'm not, I'm not defending the action. I'm not, but I have watched amazing human beings do things that are so foul that you just go, how is this possible? Because the drug makes you do things that you would never, ever do. And the drug, there was a question earlier, what the drug was. The drug is methamphetamine. Um, designed by the Nazis, World War II, one of the other gifts they gave us. Very kind. Lovely stuff. So I left. Um, I called my dad. He lived in Omaha. He lived 15 minutes from where I was that entire two years. I did see him one time in that two years. Um, somebody in our family died and I had to go to a funeral. And uh, that was when I, um, I'll keep this brief, but I was high, high, high. And I had been up for a while and he called and he was like, I have some bad news. <clears throat> My cousin had died, who was my age. He was in a car accident and thrown from the car, and they found him like days later. And he said, "You're you're gonna have to go to this funeral." And I thought, "Oh my god!" And he was like, "It's tomorrow." And I thought, "I've been up for two weeks, so I just like did a bunch more drugs to try to stay awake." Right. And um, he showed up to where I lived. He was going to have us follow him to this funeral, and that was the day. I was so excited to see him. I thought, oh my God, maybe he's changed his mind. Like maybe he'll, again, like maybe he'll get me out of this. Like I kept hoping like maybe dad's going to actually show up this time and help me. And uh, I came up to the window and I had that baby book that he had written in all the time. He wrote in it all. I was the only kid. He had three daughters and I was the only one he wrote a book about. And I walked up to the window and I was so nervous and I was high, high, high. And I said, hi, dad. And I was like, just so hopeful. And he rolled the window down and I thought he was going to say hi. And he shoves that book out at me. And he said, I'll never need this again. And I was like, okay, so you're doubling down again. So it's just, so it's the only time I saw him. And I went to the funeral and I think another year went by of my doing drugs. And then I, decided I'm not going to do this anymore. And I called my dad and I, he didn't know I was doing drugs that, that I know of. And I called him and I said, look, like if this is the one phone call I can make with you, I know you're not my dad. I know you don't want me to call you dad, but I said, I'm in trouble. I've been, I, here's the truth. I said, I have been doing drugs for the last two years with Sam and, um, I got to get out of here. I said, I have to go to Kansas city. My mother was in Kansas city at this point. She had just moved back. And I said, I don't want anything from you. I just need money for a bus ticket. That's all I'm asking. I just need to get to Kansas City. And um, in Scientology, there's a, there's a term called a degraded being. And it's like the lowest of the low. It's most mostly what we refer to as non-Scientologists. If you're a non-Scientologist, right. you're kind of in the mud. You're a degraded being. You're kind of a lower life form. Yeah, you're worthless. Things like that. Yeah. So I said, I, I, I'm not asking for anything. I just need, I said, I'll even pay you back. I just got to get away from these drugs. These drugs are going to kill me. Um, I, I, I can't be here anymore. And he said, I cannot believe he, what did he say? He said, I cannot believe that I have three children and they're the three most degraded effing beings on planet earth. He said, you make me sick and I will never help you. And he said, don't forget, don't ever call me again. And I said, okay. So I got the bus ticket on my own and uh, went to Kansas City to be with my mom. And that was the first time I uh, had ever been with my mom. I showed up and I said, hey, mom, I did not tell. Let's see. I don't think I told her that I was on drugs for the last two years. Um, my mom was in a really abusive marriage at the time. And she needed me a lot more. And I think giving her those problems was going to freak her out. Um, so I just stayed up. I would just stay up like throughout the night. I would sleep on the couch and stay up because he was a real crazy alcoholic and he was super abusive. So I just kind of watched him. And um, the, the going back to what we were saying, whatever, whoever said that to you today, I had a lot of hate in my heart, I think, for years. I used, 
I, I got a job. I cleaned myself up. I got a job. I got an apartment when I was 18 and, uh, I was living on my own. I bought my first car. Um, it was like 27% interest cause I didn't have a co-signer, <laughs> uh, but I was uh, really happy. Yeah. I was really happy with where I was at. Huh? Yeah. 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 I was super happy with where I was at. And then I got another job. So I worked two jobs and I got a dog and I was really feeling good, but I will say I was not in a good place. I slept with a lot of different men. I feel like I was just using that like men for that, like hope and kind of filling that. Like, I just wanted, I loved talking Another to drug. men who had it. Well, just who were like, I find you interesting. I uh, interesting enough. Take your pants off. Like it was validating to me looking I back. It's that. horrible. It's horrible. I would never, I, I don't even recognize myself looking back when I tell, I rarely talk about my drug history, not because I don't want to, it's just so long ago and I don't remember it very well. Like it just doesn't feel like me. So many people I've told that story to are like, that doesn't even seem like something you would do. It doesn't. It's not me. And I get um, that a lot too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I totally, I agree. Like I don't ever see you being addicted to drugs, but that's because I'm kind of kind of into you. I'm kind of into you. <laughs> um, or robbing a bank. I, yeah, that too. I, I don't ever think about it. When you say I'm a criminal or I'm a convict, I think, why do you even say that? Nobody thinks that. I don't think that. I just think you're a really good person. Like, I just think Tommy's amazing and has a big heart. It's well, it's time. true. There I don't a, think criminal. Well, it's kind. There was a comment earlier. And I, listen, I just wanted to put this up on the screen. I was not, I'm not defending your dad in any way, shape or form, but I do think it's an important um, aside, right? Because almost everybody here are, we're all of a certain age where we're a lot of us have kids, right? And it's so we go, we, there's no way to wrap your brain around this. That's the important part. If her father was the only person that this had ever happened to in history, okay, then this is an anomaly and a scumbag, right? Maybe not a great person, but it's not, it's not an anomaly at all, right? It is the norm. Like this is what happens. And it is, it is just across the board. And if, the more you think about it, I mean, how, if, how do you love something that isn't, I mean, it's, they come out of fully, uh, you know, formed the, the doctrine itself makes it really hard. They beat this out of people and they do it really, really slowly, right? Slowly. Yeah. It's not, they don't walk in the front door and go, you're not talking to your kids anymore. You're not doing this, right? They, I promise you, it's just like dope, right? The first time you, the first time you do dope, it's awesome. It's perfect. It takes care of everything. You think of, this is it. It's the answer to every prayer I ever had. I promise you when, uh, when her dad got into Scientology, that's what he thought, right? It's uh, that's what cults do. Um, they don't, they don't bring people in because they sup on day one, just like uh, just like drugs. Um, but there's, I have a feeling that uh, that your dad's probably not a great guy one way or the other. But um, yeah, I I don't know that for sure, Tommy. But I really don't think I think Scientology just enhanced and amplified that. I think my dad was probably always a bad guy. I think, I think he never wanted to do that. Yeah. He was never nice to his kids. Um, you know, so I, I can't sit here and blame Scientology for that behavior. I, it's like Dan O'Connor, you know, the guy that hit me with the fax machine, like, well, he's in a cult and he's brainwashed. Not really. I wasn't running around hitting people with fax machines. You know, I, well, I think you're just a bad violence. Person. Well, you know something it's, it's, um, it's just like a prison guard, right? It's just like a prison guard. Um, you give somebody the uh, the ability to do whatever they want to, to another human being. Good people are going to do really nice things to those people. They're going to go out of their way to make sure that even though you're in a really bad situation, they try to treat you like a human. But messed up human beings who are put in the exact same position kick the crap out of people who that they, they get, they're over the right. top of because they right. enjoy it. That's right. So yeah, that's, that's how I feel. I think it's like that in anything, you know? Well, I know that. I mean, I know that because I was... Um... I was um, involved in Scientology, watching people abuse each other physically all the time. And I never took part in that. It's a choice. Right? Yeah. No, it, it, it definitely is. Um, I'm, I'm often, uh, I don't know. It may not, there was a comment that somebody made that, uh, there are exceptions to every rule. There absolutely are. I, 
I know I'm, I always, this is a question that, that why would you have a kid? Honest to God, as a Scientologist, why, why do, why do they have children? Why do they go to funerals? These are things that, that, right. For looking from the outside, um, these things I find odd. If, if that, if they just dropped the body and moved on is what, is it a party? I mean, what, what, what are, what are these funerals like? I've never, because I remember, as I said, I had a friend that was an OT8 who, who literally had me pick him up and he was covered in this father, right? Who had just unalived himself. And I'm not joking. My brother gets more bummed out having to mop than this dude did cleaning up his dad. So I don't understand the, the, um, you know, the, what's the point of having, it just doesn't seem to me like it, it makes a lot of sense. The kids things, all of it. It seems like it's almost counterintuitive. I think that they have kids because it's easier to trap kids into Scientology, raise them, put them into the Sea Org. I mean, so many of them are born and raised like me. So it makes sense. And L. Ron Hubbard on the second dynamic, he talks a lot about it, which is the rearing of children, marriage, sex. He talks a lot about procreating, procreate, procreate, have kids. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because then you don't even have to recruit them. You just force them. That literally is the sickest thing I've ever heard in my life. It really is. It makes sense to me. Just growing up in it, it makes sense to me. That's all I'm saying. Um, those dropped bodies have a place to respawn. Interesting. Oh. Um, I think that you're right. Evil people use these types of things to do their horrible things. Scientology, polygamy, cults, uh, cults in general attract these evil people. Uh, you know what? So does crime, right? For real. Um, if if somebody uh, if somebody steals six kilos of cocaine from you, right? You don't call the cops and say, "Hey, somebody stole six kilos of cocaine from me." You call a bad person, right? Who runs a police department? <laughs> you call the mob and you say, "Hey, this guy stole all my dope." And they say, we'll go get it back, but we're going to keep half of it. Sounds ridiculous, right? But I promise you at every level of life, there are these little subcultures and there are sick human beings that get drawn to them because the Danny Mastersons of the world look at angles and see places like this and go, here's a bunch of people that can't call the cops. Really, really effed up, but that's, that's really how it comes down. I don't know that this is such a dumb question. Uh, but do you get a discount on your lessons for having kids? No. Do can not. you hear me? Because my mic just unplugged. You're, yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Oh, okay. Okay. I plugged it back in, but I wanted to be sure. No. I can hear you. Yeah. There's um, no discounts. <laughs> no, and here's what's not funny. a dumb question, I, I, but I mean, no, there's no discounts. No. They want all your money. Well, and I, uh, I've talked about this before, right? I, uh, I worked in boiler rooms with uh, Scientologists, by the way, a bunch of them, but. Uh, these guys would brag about how they would call uh, people on Christmas day. <laughs> they would call people the day their kids were born to say, get some cash lined out, right? Let's get them through, you know, start by the way, to everybody who put a queue up on your, uh, I love you people. I really do. Thank you so much for the thoughts and prayers. Uh, no word other than he's, uh, he's still with us. We don't have, it's very difficult getting anything out, but I see the, uh, the, um, the avatars and I love you guys. That, that means a lot to me. Sorry. It's not a dumb question. The amount of money that people put up before their kids can even speak. Like my friends used to brag about just how much cash they would bring in. And they are the most cutthroat. Like you want to see a guy on a telephone that can take money from people? Get someone that used to do it in Scientology. I'm not joking. They're the best in the world. I mean, it's a bad way to make a living, but they're the best in the world. Cutthroats. Sorry. Um, well, that's that was my connection to, to Scientology was not the religious part of it. It's that they all work in dirt bag phone room kind of jobs. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. A um, couple of good questions just came in. Long time lurker. What happened to the baby your sister was pregnant with? She gave it up for adoption. Um, and then do you think your dad watches your channel? Absolutely not. My father hates me more than anything you can imagine. Absolutely not. I'm sure he wishes I were dead. And then somebody said something too, that I thought was a good question. Uh, what do you got? 
I'm looking. I, it, oh, were my father's parents in Scientology? Did I know them? That's a good question. Um, his father died. Both of my grandfathers died before I was born of cancer, sadly. So his dad died of leukemia, which I don't know if that's cancer, honestly. Isn't it, it is, a type yeah, of? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, it's a yeah, type of cancer. Bone, so bone his cancer. dad died of leukemia. So I never met him. He was extremely... I don't want to say close. He admired his father from what I can tell. He hated his mother. So we were not really allowed to have much of a relationship with her. Um, I met her a couple of times when I was little. She was highly, very religious woman, very nice lady from what I recall. Um, we went to, she took me to church when I was like five or six. My parents were still married and she bought me this little dress and got me all dressed up, took me to church and, uh, we got in the car after church and my sister said to my dad, why do we have to be in Scientology? And that was it. We never saw her again. He disconnected. Wow. Yeah. We questioned it. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. I think my dad hated women. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, uh, he certainly went through a lot of them. You know? I mean, yeah. Church. Yeah. It, it's a, a lot of people struggle with that word. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I don't know. We need a, we need a really ugly name. It's, it's certainly a, a uh, very destructive cult, you know, a good rule of thumb people. Some of these uh, every, about once every four or five videos, someone will leave a, a message that, uh, that says something about me, this place or us being a cult. Uh, if, if someone tells you to get away from somebody, to disconnect from anybody for any reason. If they tell you that you should only hang out with people who agree with you, run like hell. Right? If they tell you the world's ending, run like hell. If they tell you you should give them all your money, run like hell. Right? There should be some really uh, big flashing neon signs. However, they don't do the, any of those things on day one. They say, take yeah, a personality test. Let's teach so you how true. to communicate. It's so true, but being born into it, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think anything of that. Right. As a matter of fact, they had me so believing that the opposite of what you just said, if you go into the outside world, run back in. If you meet anybody that wants to be your friend, that's not a Scientologist run. I mean, they had me thinking the opposite of that. Don't trust anybody that's right. not in this organization. And that's and the, how they get you to do that. They get you to disconnect. So you, you said something the last time that we were talking about, um, you were, you said, you know, you'd be in a store in the checkout line and you would be afraid to look at the uh, National Enquirer in case it had a, uh, you yeah. know, a, a story about, you know, oh, yeah. a Scientologist or about Scientology or whatever. Um, how about this thing? I mean, when, when you got a smartphone, we, how about South Park? How about all of those things that were out? I know you you said that when you were uh, on vacation with your family and they said, you really got to check out, you know, Leah Remini in the after. And you were like, look, I will get on the plane. I will head back home. Do, uh, do you remember the first time you saw the South Park episode? I never saw it. You have to this day? Wow. No, because um, they put out, um, God, I can't even remember what it's called. Now I really try to forget about everything Scientology. When there's black PR, what is it called? Ugh. Oh my God. It's a specific thing that they put out. Um, they put out in the church and it's, um, it's the truth about everything. So like the Leah Remini show, I can't believe I can't think of what it's called. The Leah Remini show, they put out, they put a booklet together and like, here's the truth of it. And they give us all a copy. So they did right. that with the South park thing. And, um, they said, first of all, don't ever look at it, but here's the truth in case uh, a non-Scientologist tries to talk to you about this. So you kind of have an idea um, of what dead agent package. Thank you, Kim Hallman. My Lord, goosebump. I got it. Thank you. Um, dead agent. They put out a dead agent pack. Thank you. And um, so they did that with the aftermath stuff. They do it with anything that comes out bad PR, black PR is what we call it. So no, I've never seen it. I 
think I've seen maybe South, like a clip of South Park once. I don't. Because the episode they did, they do on Scientology literally was probably the biggest atomic bomb to, uh, to the cult that ever existed. So if you're not familiar, you you familiar with the concept you've even heard, they go on and do the entire Xenu story and throughout the thing at the bottom, it says across the bottom, no, we're not joking. This is exactly what they believe. And they, Go through and kind of do the entire, you know, uh, Thetan thing and all of that. It is a masterpiece, <laughs> says <laughs> Cricket. Um, it really is pretty crazy, but it was. Um, it got a bunch of people in uh, in popular culture talking about it. it That's was, uh, what made what's his name quit. I met him in real life. Which uh, what's his name? The guy that the the really cool dude that was in South Park. I met him in London. The guy, he had to quit. Isaac Hayes. Oh, Isaac Hayes. Yeah, yeah he had to quit. About shit. He had to quit because of yeah, that. Yeah, he did. He was forced to quit because of that. He yes, met Isaac yes. Hayes. I got great voice. Yeah, I met him. Cool guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I've never seen any of that stuff. That's what I mean. I when you're a seasoned Scientologist, you know better than to do something like that. You know um, what? We need we need a watch party. I'm not even kidding you. Do that on the on the cruise. That you really need to see that. It's one of the funniest things. I mean, you really. I promise you, you will enjoy it. We should have a watch party. Uh, we should. And Meryl, I like your question there. How did you go back to Scientology after you moved in with your mom and your mom and your sister were out? Um, I immediately went back, Meryl. Um, I, when I moved back to Kansas city, my mother was not a Scientologist and she was very clear that she was not going to be involved in it. And I said, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go back. So I did immediately went back and I sat down with my very closest friend, Dan O'Connor. And, um, it was like nothing had occurred. I mean, he did say, because when you leave without completing a contract, you get what's called a freeloader's debt. And that mm -hmm. is a whole list of what, how much money you owe for everything you did because you didn't complete your contract. So mine yep. was well over a hundred thousand dollars. And Dan made it clear to me that I got that wiped for you. And I know what he was saying. I think he did it because I was a minor. I mean, how are you going to give me right. a bill? Um, where is your sister now? That's a good question. I love Elizabeth Bates. That's our good therapist. I've, I've interviewed her. Um, she, I believe, lives in Arizona. Um, she is disconnected from my niece. My niece disconnected from her long ago. Never forgave her for all the things that occurred. And um, I have not spoken to my sister in decades. I don't. Her birthday was two days ago. She's 52 now. And I'm shocked that she's still alive, but she is. She has a Facebook. And uh, she was in prison for a long time. She went to prison. And um, I don't know if she still does drugs. She looks like she still does drugs, but I have no idea. Um, I think she's not, not well, you know. And I feel really sad about her situation. Something terrible happened with her um, that caused me I left her. Um, I, I left her. I came, I came to Kansas city, stayed with my mom. About a year went by. I had my apartment. I was clean. Okay. I'm just going to do this real quick. I love you, Elizabeth. And um, everybody's from Omaha. I'm from Omaha. Mom's from Omaha. Mom's family's in Omaha. We went back to Omaha for the first time. My mother and I, we drove back and, um, my mother was going to stay with her sister and my sister knew I was coming, my drug addict sister. And I, she wanted to see me. And I said, I don't want to see you if you're going to put me near any drugs. I've been clean for a year. I'm away from it. I have a job. I have an apartment. I don't want to do it. And she said, you're not going to do it. Don't worry. You're not going to do it. And I said, okay. So she picked me up and took me to council bluffs, Iowa, which is like meth capital of the world. And she took me to a drug just a drug house, just a random guy. The second we walked in, there were like people on the floor. There was a dude with the needle in his arm. And I said, I can't be here. And, um, she said, you're going to, she shoved the foil into my face. And she said, you gotta, you gotta take a hit because otherwise people are going to think, you know, you're already freaking out. And I was freaking out. I was like, I told you not to bring me here. I don't want to be around this. I was really oh, freaking out. And she Everybody was like, you think you're heat. They're all freaking yeah. out. Take yep. a hit. Shut up. Yep. Yep. 
so, um, took the hit and I've told you this, Tommy, but I don't think it was math. It was something else. I don't know what happened, but I, I immediately lost bodily functions. Like I couldn't move. I peed all over this couch. Um, I was sweating. I was freezing. I tried to, I grabbed my phone. I said, I'm calling 911. I can't. And they took my phone away. It was horrible. Um, hours and hours. We went through the night. I could not move. I think I peed like five times on this person's couch by morning. I restored function. She drove me back to my mother, threatening me the whole way. She was like, I will kill you. I will come to Kansas city with three men and we will kill you. If you ever talk, if you ever tell your mom what happened. So we got in the car, my mom and I, and my mom says, I'm going to have you drive the first half. And I said, Oh God. Okay. And I drove my mom's car into somebody's porch, front porch. I couldn't drive. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do anything. And I told my mom what happened and she was so furious. Now we have different moms, same dad. So this was not her daughter. And my mom was really, really furious and, um, didn't talk to her again after that, went back to Kansas city. Um, excuse me. And, um, she threatened me. She was calling me for a couple of months and she was like, I'm going to F and kill you. And do you want to die and all that? So I never talked to her again. And it's weird. Just about three months ago, she messaged me on Facebook. She's never reached out to me. And she sent me a bunch of pictures of when I was little. And she said like, do you remember this? And I said, yeah, I do. And I hope you're doing well. And she didn't answer me. So my other sister is friends with her on Facebook and feels sorry for her and kind of tells me sometimes like, hey, oh, she texted me and she said, hey, did you know today is Sam's birthday the other day? And I said, yeah. So she feels more feeling toward her, but she didn't go through all of that with her. And I just think it would be toxic to bring her back into my life. I can't trust her. I don't know if she's on drugs. I don't know if, you know, if I offered her a place to stay, would she steal from me? Or, you know, I have a child. I don't want, I don't want anything around that. Yeah, you can't, uh, this is what, I mean, this is like the focus of my basically every day, but you got to start real, real slow. You sort of got to just start with the, Hey, let's make contact because the, the, yeah, the moving in thing and, and all of that, you really do have to set up uh, a hedge, especially around a, a family and with people that, you know what, because this is the question, isn't it? Tommy, what makes some people able to just walk away from drugs and others can't shake it? Well, here's what happens very often, right? Let's say me and Reese decide to go start partying together, right? And we uh, we choose heroin as the drug of choice. And we start doing it every single day. In about 14 days, she's going to be dependent on the drug, right? So am I. That means that if we don't do it the following day, we're both going to get sick. Okay. Now, they grab us both. They throw us in a room. They say, no more dope. For about three or four days, we're going to be viciously ill. For about two or three more after that, it's going to suck. And then afterwards, she's going to look at me and go, I'm never doing that again. What the hell was that about? I'm going to be kicking the door down to go get more of it because she was dependent and I was addicted. Now, this may sound crazy. And for a very long time, people used to argue to the point of fistfights over this. It's no longer a debate, right? You could put someone on a machine, which will take an image of your brain. And my brain won't look like yours, right? My brain's different. And for that reason... Uh, I don't have the ability to walk away. Now I did, but I had to do a whole bunch of stuff and I had to learn a whole different way of life. And I had to, there's just a lot I have to do. I'm not like other people. And that's just kind of the way it is. I live a different life. It's a great life. I'm happy as hell, but it is way different. I'd be stoked if I could just go back to, uh, to the person that, you know, but it's not how it works. So Yvonne, the answer is uh, just like some people can go and eat whatever they want. Right. And two friends can hit 300 pounds eating everything in sight. One's going to get diabetes and one isn't. Right. Yeah. Type two, type two diabetes because he was born with the ability to mess up and get it. Just like an addict is born with the ability to mess up and get addicted. If he never does it, he's still an addict, believe it or not. It's still in there waiting. But if, you know, that person never finds their drug of choice or never tries it. It's not an issue, but that's really what it comes down to. I know it sounds crazy, but it's just whether or not you got the disease. So I would say that I was not an addict. I don't think you were. I think you were dependent. You know what I mean? You do it for that long and your body starts to get a dependency on it. And, you know, when you talked about how you would crash afterwards, like those are all, um, you know, those are all signs of the dependency of it. But 
not being an addict, when you separate the person who's dependent from the drug, they usually don't go back. It's very rare that they decide to go back. And the reason that your sister did this, because everybody wrote, why would anyone do anything like that? Those sick people, I'll explain it to you really simply. If you end up with somebody who does not do dope and you bring that person with you and you do not necessarily feel comfortable at all, the first thing you're going to do is make that person do dope because everybody around goes, okay, nothing to worry about. I enter a room or I do anything. It is the instant uh, acceptance. And I know that this is sick, but I've watched it my entire life. And I've watched, you hear horror stories. I'm working with a guy right now whose dad started giving him meth when he was 11. Because dad wasn't going to sit in a room and worry that this kid was going to tell mom what was going on. So he just made the kid a, a partner. And that's kind of how this stuff tends to happen. And it's pretty sick and disgusting. But no one in their right mind does any of this crap. No one in their right mind joins a cult. You get in there and you start and it's that little hit and it's that little hit. And it's, hey, we're communicating a lot better, aren't we? What a nice group of friends. They all seem to be so successful. That dentist, you know, he's a Scientologist too. And the next thing you know, right, you're, you're making a That's needle crazy. Float and you're sticking one in your arm. But either way, you're looking for the same thing. That's um. That's just crazy. I I didn't ever think about like the dependency versus being an addict. And I don't think I was an addict, but I do. When I got to Kansas City, like the first couple of weeks, I called the dealer in Omaha, Cliff. And I said, do you know anybody in Kansas City? Like, I can't handle this. I do. I feel like I need well, a little say dealer's name something to you on the on the air. They get really upset. I don't even know <laughs> if he's still kidding. alive. I mean, I'm just kidding. 20 years ago. Uh and I didn't give his last name. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just funny to me. Go ahead. Okay. I am sorry. That's just great. So I called Cliff and uh, I said, do you know anybody in Kansas City? I really feel like I just need a little something. And he gave me a name. And I met up with this guy. It was <laughs> someone said, hey, Cliff. <laughs> and I met up with uh, I met up with his friend in Kansas City. And it was amazing. And he had meth with him. He had a little pack and he was like, I can sell this to you. He was like, but you are a really pretty girl. And he was like, you're young (laughs) and you have your whole life ahead of you. And he was like, I really don't want to do it. Like you're clean for two weeks. You're doing good. Like you got away from it. You just go home. Yeah. And I did. I didn't do it. Good. I know they exist. They exist. I'm not kidding. I'm pretty sure we made out like right before. Yeah. Yeah. I think he had an, I had, he had another motive, but yeah, no, it was really cool. I remember exactly where we met and he pulled it out the little, uh, the little eight ball or teener or whatever he had. And I was like, yeah. And I, um, I had the money and he was like, you know, he said, you're really (laughs) cute. I don't think you should do this. It's. (laughs) (laughs) Izzy, I love you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I thought I heard it. You heard that thing slam shut. Uh, that is just too funny. Sealed up watertight like a dolphin's bee hole. Yeah. That's right. See this right here, people? This is it. I can't take a shot without drinking a fifth or more. I know it is, ju- is so. I just don't allow it to happen now. Addiction never goes away. You just learn to resist it. You want to hear the best one ever? This came from my uh, my mentor, Q. He said, the only way to win a fist fight with heroin is to not get in a fist fight with heroin. And that's been it, right? I'm in, I'm killing it. I got nothing to worry about. When I say I am going to leave this planet without doing it again, it's because I will never get into that fight. I know it will kick my ass. I've never, ever won one. So there's just no reason for starting again. Not very good with it. Um, but you know what? A dealer with a heart, everybody says 1%, 1%. You would be astounded. You would be astounded at the number of dealers that are like that. And you go, oh, come on. No, because here's the deal. You ever see anybody with an ad campaign for for drugs? You know, you don't see four heroin addicts. I mean, heroin dealers sitting around going, we need a marketing campaign. What can we call this stuff? Right? Trust me. You know, if you look at someone and you think, I don't need the money from this person. I really don't. No, I don't want to watch this person. If you're slinging that stuff and watching people disintegrate, you look at someone that's young and fresh tell you some really sad stories, but there are, there are actually a lot of dealers that in the, at least in the beginning, we'll, we'll do everything they can to say, Jack has been on here. Most of the people on the boat know my friend, Jack. He said to me, I want to shoot. Like, he'd been smoking the stuff forever. I said, I'm not ever helping you do that. Like there's never going to be a discussion. I'm never, 
and I had just finished cooking one and he picked it up off the desk and went wham right like through the jeans through everything he just pressed it he's like all right well now that we've done that can you show me how to do it right and I was just like you know what but there are, uh, trust me there are very few people who really want to stick a needle in someone's arm for the first time you really got I I don't do it I never did it people don't do it it's it's a disgusting horrific thing but believe it or not there are dealers that don't want to be those people and they've usually got about 150 guys like me that were giving them three hundred dollars six hundred dollars a day every day they don't they don't need to hurt any uh, yeah nice young folks I have a question about Scientology and I'll tell you why I asked this I've never met a more racist group of people in my life I'll yeah. be really honest and I don't mean you I'm talking about the people that I worked with when I was uh, when I was on the uh uh, and when I was on the doing the public speaking thing, I worked with four and I have never met people and maybe they weren't, but they use words that would lead you to believe that they were. Is there yeah. something in the doctrine that of L. Ron Hubbard that was not kind to uh, uh, people with darker skin? Not that I'm aware of, but super, super unkind to people who were gay. Um, I, yes. I don't know why the racism exists. I've never read anything. I'm there. That doesn't mean there isn't anything, but right. I've never read anything. There are, there were a few, there was like two, three members in Kansas city that were black. Um, and they were not treated any differently. I mean, I, I'm still friends with one of them on Facebook, which is bizarre. He's like one of the last stragglers that won't <laughs> delete me. Um, does he know so, who you are? Well, yeah, I'm friends with him. Okay. I think he probably doesn't get on Facebook ever. It's probably what it is. But um, I don't know. My father was is extremely racist. He's married to a woman woman from Peru now. And um, he would really make fun of that and be like, you know, understand, no comprende. I mean, he would really make fun of her. Um, he used terrible racist words growing up. And yeah, the gay issue, that. Elizabeth Bates, this is my... Um, this is my girlfriend here, actually, speaking of gay. She is, she's gay and she's gorgeous. And we kind of, we kind of like each other, kind of like each other. And um, she, uh, no, not she, L. Ron Hubbard wrote in um, Science of Survival specifically that gay people are a lower quality. They, they, um, it's a whole, it's a whole, he has a whole, it's called the human chart of evaluation. And he has it all mapped on what gay people think of toward children, what their health is like. It's a crazy chart and it can tell you everything they think in their minds about the environment, the world. And he just says they should all be roped up, put together on an island somewhere because gay people are like some of the most evil of all people. And it was bizarre. I never felt that way. I never agreed with that. But my father hates gay people. I read that. All that stuff. I was like, you can find that. It's not hard to find. If you want to go out no, and read it, what he wrote you know, about it, it, I mean, yeah, that's that's a super easy I one. I, I, and well, I looked up the stuff on uh, because of the the question about um, the racism. I couldn't find anything, but the stuff on on uh, homosexuality. Oh no, he's uh, he was real, real clear uh, as far as that goes. Yes, yes, they are very low, low, low subhuman homosexuality uh, there are no gay people in scientology scientologists yeah. think gay people are just disgusting yeah uh, which uh which probably a bit of an issue for a couple of their famous ones you know what i mean but i don't know <laughs> i don't know about that with like people of different skin color because you are not elizabeth not in my eyes girl um because um you know there's orgs all over the world there's right. a huge org in africa so I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think you met some racist ones. I think my dad was racist. Um, I can tell you Doug and Brenda Argus, my closest family members that disconnected from us, never picked up on anything racist from them. Never. Not once. Well, you so know what? I, and, and I shouldn't and I shouldn't say that I just the 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 language, you know what I mean? Just the um the the they used words that at the time I probably should have said something but didn't care. I've uh he was really, he was kind of changed my, uh, I've, I was never a racist person. I was the kind of guy that probably wouldn't have stopped anybody from saying anything these days. I'm probably, um, I'm probably the guy that would, is going to uh, say something. Oh, for sure. Me too. Me as well. I never did growing up, but I always felt very uncomfortable about it. Um, but I really don't think there's anything about racism in Scientology. I think there's just racist people. 
Um, and yeah. somebody said, are there closet gays? Of course, I'm sure there's closet gays. Everywhere. I right. always believed Dan O'Connor was gay and I still do. And I, so How many about people. about LRH's been. son? Quentin. If you do a little, yeah. yeah. If you do a little research about LRH's kid, I mean, the, that's the, that's the theory. The working theory is that the gay. reason he unalived himself was because, you know, that had to be, first of all, good Lord, but to be, to come into the world gay and be L. Ron Hubbard's kid had to be, so, horrible horrible oh and yeah there's the rumors of john travolta but i don't know any i mean honestly i don't know i don't know if those are true rumors or if he really is gay it's a you know, shame if he's not he's gay there are more pictures of him with his tongue in another guy's mouth than anybody else's in this there like, are yeah there's just yeah if you if you get if you google his name and i didn't do it for that reason but you just do an image search and half of the pictures are of him kissing men i was trying to make a thumbnail is the only reason i was doing it really but, yeah. See, that makes see, me again, sad. It makes me sad that he has to suppress that. Like, why can't he just be himself? I don't care that he's gay. But, oh, he came out of the closet? Is that officially, Kelly? Well, I, don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I had not heard that. But, um, <laughs> Shelly, <laughs> Shelly, tell us what you think. <laughs> yeah, Shell. That makes me sad. It always makes me sad in any religion when it's not accepted to be gay. Like, I just, it's 2024, and I think people should absolutely be able to be happy, be themselves. Um, that makes me sad. Who cares? There's just so much other crap that you could uh, be concerned with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, honest yeah. to God, there's just, maybe just being nicer. Um, yeah. I uh, I met uh, Travolta. I think I've, I've told that story. I met them all the same day when I was, uh, when I was going to become a, um, when I was going to become a public speaker. <laughs> I or, met him. Uh, yeah, they uh, they had a whole little a little party. It didn't work out, which is good. Who knows? Maybe we would have met. Uh, you and I. Yeah, we could have. I, I I could have been this close. They gave me the. I was out in. Um, uh, can I say this guy? I said his name on the other channel. Probably bad form, but I was at Emmett's house. Have I ever told you about him? He's yeah. A, he's an OTA. Yeah, I was at his place, and they had this little gathering. They were trying to find speakers like to go and pitch because I used to work with them as a, as a public speaker. And they were giving me the pitch of how I could go around and basically get people in. They were going to fill rooms. And it was sounded he's like, and you can sell packages. See, as a speaker, four hundred ninety nine dollars is the most you could sell at the front of the room. But he's like, you could sell a two hundred thousand dollar package. He's like, you could sell a million dollar package. You find the right family. You could sell a five million dollar package. I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I'm like, what's the commission on that? He's like, 20 points. I said, I'm in. Right? I'm in. Let's do this. And they pulled out the e-meter and he pinches you and he did this whole little like little little show, which is kind of cool. And uh, but it was funny because I was I was uh, the the lady I was with came up and said, uh, we're the only people here drinking. And I said, That's ridiculous. Everybody here is drinking. She's like, No, everybody here has a drink in their hand. <laughs> He's like, nobody here is drinking. She's like, for real, watch yourself. And I went back up to the bar and had another drink. And I was walking around looking. And I promise you, she and I probably had six or seven drinks each. And there were, you know, 13 drinks served that night. Everybody else just walked around with a drink in their hand. And when it got to the part where I said, do they pay you once a month, every two weeks? And he's like, well, it doesn't exactly work like that. And I go, well, how exactly does it work? He's like, well, you can work your way through the program this way. Like you don't get paid in cash, but you get paid so that you can work. And he started to explain this bridge thing and why he was so successful. But at the time I was making more money than him. So it didn't seem like, oh, wow. like my numbers were better. So it didn't seem like that was such a great idea. In fact, I kind of laughed. I just went, yeah, I'm good on that. I like the idea of the 20% commission. I probably would have done it at that point in my life, but I wouldn't have done it for, uh, for my way back up the, uh, the bridge. <laughs> that would have been great. We wouldn't have probably crossed paths because I, I was it. in Kansas City. Yeah. And I would have been in LA. Or just That's outside wild. of Glendale. It was actually it's wild that we were kind of close. To Clearwater. What's like that? it could have happened. It's wild that it could have happened. Well, you know what? It's, chances are, I mean, people say things. I, I guarantee you, almost everybody, if you're in the US, I was in a city you were in at the same time at some point. I guarantee it. I mean, that's, I, I, I covered a lot of this country, covered a lot of this country. 
more than the more than I would have liked to. I think sadly. I like it. Goosebump, good to see you. Cosmic Christy. Glad that you're here. Cricket. So do you feel all right? How do you feel? Yeah. Heavy? I think. No, I I feel much better. I can talk. That's why I say I, it took me a long time to get here, Tommy. I'm pretty much at peace. I, I go to therapy every week. I feel good. I can talk about this stuff and not take it as personally super, as I used to. There was a question that uh, came up a couple of uh, times earlier. Um, the people said, what is the, what's the deal with all of the smoking and all of the cursing? But if you let kids run wild, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like, um, what was the, uh, what was that great book? Lord of the Flies, right? I mean, this is what happens when you let, uh, you know, when you let fully formed well, look at, uh, thetans. <laughs> who, look at who our examples are, too. When the kids, I mean, look at L. Ron Hubbard. His teeth were black from smoking. I mean, he had rotten mouth. I think um, my brother smoking said they was... looked like baked beans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gross. I don't feel <laughs> so, so upset strong. about my horse teeth now. Your teeth are, you know what? You are such a judgmental person on yourself. You, got, you like literally it. got the perfect grill. You know what I mean? Like you have the perfect grill. Um, right. She's like, yeah. Thank you. Can someone tell me how Reese and Tommy met? We haven't officially. Uh, in in Clearwater, Florida. Um, at a, uh, That's not how we met. It is. Oh, you meant like the first time we ever spoke? Uh, we met through AA run. It seems like so I, long ago. It seems like a long time ago. So here's the way it went down. I was uh, I was brought in j big beans. Is Johnny funny or what? Uh, I I am very often brought on to shows as an expert because I robbed a bunch of banks and went to prison because of it. Um, and I've done time in state and federal prison. And for that reason, I am very often brought in as an expert on either that or drugs, right? So color commentary kind of thing, because somehow I managed to get out of there and still be able to speak. Yeah. So during the uh, the Danny Masterson trial, um, a Aaron was talking and there was uh, there were some things that were being said about prison that were um, not not quite right. And when that's the case, I usually, you know, we reach out and say, hey, would you if you would like to. And I wasn't even trying to get on the air. I just said, if, but if you'd like to hear how that how it works, you know, I'd be willing to talk to you. My brother had been watching him for years and Aaron reached out and he said, hey, let's, let's get you on tomorrow. And uh, I kind of hit it off with uh, with the audience. And after doing that, I went out for the Danny Masterson sentencing and met a lot of second gens and, and met the uh, the Jane Doe's and got a little bit more um, emotionally involved. Right. Because this stuff's hard to listen to. Right. I'm sure a lot of you cried today. It's harder when you meet these people. I promise you it is. You know, when you hear these stories in person, it's really hard to get through. And you know what? It's either going to make you grit your teeth, right? Or it's going to make you walk away and it made me grit my teeth. And then Aaron was kind enough to say to both of us, I think at different times, you guys really should just do a show together because I think you guys would hit it off anyway. And you're right, Yvonne, it becomes personal. It's exactly what happens. It becomes very, very personal. Um that's a good question. What's your biggest surprise since you've left uh, Scientology? Um, I, I, um, I think probably just how fearful I was of the outside world. That's why they hold that being declared over your head. Like if you get declared, you're kicked out, you lose all your friends, you lose your dentist. That's why I have these teeth now and to get a different <laughs> dentist. Um, your dentist you, looks like, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, finish your sentence. Whoa, that dentist is. And it could be watching. Looks like a lovely dentist. You know, I feel bad about that. I thought, well, I hope she That's doesn't watch it. I said, I said on my live earlier, I was like, I hate them. I look like a horse. I have horse mouth. And I was like, oh no, she's not going to take that kind of time to watch. If you guys saw what she looked like. More importantly, she didn't manufacture the teeth. She put the teeth in. Besides, isn't she busy uh, dancing tonight? I'm kidding. She's just, she looks, doesn't look like a, a uh, come on. That was a it's, joke. Wait till you see the picture come I screenshot on. a couple hours ago. Wait till you see it. I'm going to send it one. to you. I don't want to see is, it. It is top of the line. 
quality stuff. Um, uh, uh, what was I, uh, the biggest surprise. So they hold it over your head so much. Um, once you're out, you know, it's going to be, you're going to be kicked out into the outside world, all that. And, um, I have been told from a very young age, how terrible non-scientologists are and how much we should fear them because they're just a lower form. It's L. Ron Hubbard says that we are not in the mud like the rest of them. They're swimming in the mud. You guys are swimming through mud and we're not. We're up above, you know, in the, in the stars or an ice cube or what have you. And um, so I think the biggest thing is how amazing everybody is, how trustworthy people are, how much they made Huxley's birthday, uh, his first birthday out of Scientology, how special that was. Um, just how supportive people are. It's not anything they tell us it's going to be. And um, that goes on the other way too. Like when a person gets declared in Scientology, we are told that they are equal to Hitler. Um, so that's the other thing is I now know that that's not true. They had me believing that when people would get declared. Welcome to the mud pit. Thank you, T. Louise. Nice. Welcome to the mud pit. I'm not, uh, I'm not, wall I'm just sort of wallowing in it. You know what I mean? Kind of comfy in my mud. A lot like of a cute little pig. You know what? I never really viewed myself as the, uh, the cute little piggy type. I don't really wallowing. think of you that way either. You're more of like a penguin or a falcon, something there really you go. cute. I don't have yeah. my falcon. It's in my falcon hoods in the other room. Um, it's okay. You get it after the show. Falcon. I, you know I, what I mean, regardless. yeah, if you don't mind. Your dentist had me questioning my uh, sexuality. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, she didn't have me uh, questioning mine. That's odd. Guys, my dentist, I'm going to be don't honest. Hold I up look... your dentist pictures. Look at the poor thing. All right, let's look at my dentist. Oh, I hadn't seen that one. What the hell is that? Me either. I just saw it two hours ago. I have a two Whoa. Thing. So bad. It just came on. You have no Whoa. idea. Do you have a number? Do you have yeah. a number for this uh, for this woman? She is like she's like thing. in her she has like fully grown kids too in college. Look at that. Whoa. That's who worked on my teeth college? yesterday. Yeah. You forgot to say hi to the hater, Jules. Come on, don't do that. You gotta say hi to the hater. Oh, you know the hater. The hater who watches who watches us. Yeah. She doesn't like yeah, me guys. too. There's no reason not to like me. I'm the nicest person ever. I'm like I'm super nice. You know, she's so hot. That dentist. When I first started seeing her, I was like, "Oh man, I gotta like I have a cleaning today. I gotta do my hair, and I like tried to do my makeup." And she's now, not my type. now I go. I'm like I purposely try to let my outsides match my insides. Like I go to therapy every week. I wear sweatpants because I don't want to go to therapy looking like a trollop. Like you don't want to dress up <laughs> to go to therapy. You want to match your. You want to match what's going on. My poor therapist probably thinks I'm like such a bum. I'm, I never put makeup on. So Did now it's the hater hung this long. I'd like to think she hung this long. I'm sorry. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but now I go to the dentist and I think dress down. Don't even try to match. Like don't compare. She's going to judge. However I look, that's the most perfect specimen you'll ever see. So that's what I did yesterday. Oh, Jules. I knew which hater you meant. No, I knew yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. which hater you meant. She doesn't like me either. I think she thinks that uh, she hates you, know. you too. Yeah. She thinks, she, she thinks, yeah, she, uh, and it's not, I don't know. If, I don't know if you Nor saw but it's when notes. I, when I spoke to her, she actually sounded like from the, the wicked witch from Dorothy. She was like, I've seen you. She was like, and your little boyfriend oh, no, too. Did. Yeah. No, and I thought, Oh my God, it literally room. was like, and your little dog too. I thought, and <laughs> when she said your boyfriend, I said, which one girl, I got tons of YouTube boyfriends. Oh no, no. She was talking about the abs. She wasn't talking about the other ones. My, my boy put the ab shot up and that's the one that she was like, oh no, no, mm -hmm. see. Um, it was you. It she's was you. A, a hottie bombalotti. Yeah, yeah. That um, dentist. What, what is, is the, unbelievable. Uh, what was the what's the female equivalent of what um what did you the uh, swinger? What did that what did you say the female uh version of the swinger was? We covered this on gonna, the last show. I don't want to. You know, you're, you, you're afraid my you're, mom's watching. Yep. Yep. I was just going to say your mother could be watching and you know, now I'm scared to come over to your house. So 
<laughs> I don't want to be on your channel. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it clean. I already am scared That's to flash right. my flash my hot stripper dentist. Right. Oh, yeah. Hold on one second, one second. Sorry, just thoughts and prayers. Steve, Steve Molinsky. Uh, Steve Molinsky, please, everybody. Still, uh, still fighting these guys. Except this. It's bad stuff, but he's still fighting. That's Reese has terrible. a uh, in-law family member who uh, thinks, thinks Reese, Reese is a hussy. Is a hussy. Yeah. I hope she, I like that rumor and I hope that it spreads. It's not a bad rumor. It's not a bad rumor. I'm never going to be as hot as the dentist. I get so self-conscious when, we, when she shined that type. light on me yesterday and she went to inject my gums. I said, Dr. Careswell, don't look at my beard. I get so nervous now when I'm around her. She was like, you don't you know have what? a beard. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be like super rude, but was her rack on you when she was, <laughs> what oh, do you yeah. mean? Like look at, absolutely. I mean, I, how could she have seen your? Uh, how could she have seen your chin over her? Um, her yeah, uh, they healthy... pop out of the scrubs. They come out. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, she looked like she was in danger of catching a chest cold. Yeah, it was amazing. I couldn't. I could hardly breathe. I don't know how she got actually to the mouth because they were pillows up against my cheeks. It was nice. Is there, they is were there warm. Very big waiting rooms. Or like, was there a lot of people in the waiting room? Two old ladies. Huh? I think it's so weird. Really? I show. I told her about my channel. She goes, "What's your channel called?" And I said, "Well, you don't need to know that." I said, "But you do need to know that there's a ton of men from other states that want to know if you take their insurance." Right. Yeah. yeah. And she and she grabbed her boob and she went, "I bet they do." And I was like, "Oh, get it, girl. Wow. Dang. Okay. Yeah. Well, when you pay that you kind of what? money, um, they can uh, they can do that." You know what I mean? Like women, women can do that. Guys can't do that. If I if I stood up and grabbed my junk right now, I'd I'd be canceled by the end of the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd say it is a complete double standard. You know what I mean? You take your the shirt last off. Last time I saw her, I my shirt off. Everybody leaves. What? The last time, the last time I saw time... her, I was getting a crown, and she said, "What do you have for the rest of the day?" And I said, "I have a pap smear after this, and I don't know what's worse. I don't know seeing you." And she said, "Seeing me is always better." I think she's kind of. Yeah. I think she knows how hot she is. Is this how you she... pick? Is this how you pick doctors? I mean, is your pap smear? Uh, the, you know, is your gynecologist hot as hell too? No. So I had a really hot one, and I didn't know it. And when she walked in the room, I said, "Absolutely not!" Like I have flaps in all kinds of places. You cannot be skinny and have this perfect triangular. You know what? <laughs> Yours has to be kind of rounded <laughs> like mine. So I found a chubby one, and I've stuck with her ever since. She's super overweight, and. uh, I have no problem putting my feet into those stirrups. It's beautiful. We have the same fatty pouch and we talk about it every time. And it's nice. It's nice to get naked with somebody that, you know, looks like you. I, uh, Shelly. I've, I've been through that. I've gotten, uh, I've had to, uh, to get naked in a room full of doctors on more than one occasion. It's, uh, um, Tommy, I don't think we why did you bait me into this? Road. I didn't want I to do this on your start. channel. We only do this on my channel and I'm upset. I don't like it. Your people don't like it when we talk like this. Guys, I'm so sorry. Thank you for having me. We'll uh, I keep it keep it uh, clean. See that? You have a picture of Tommy's six pack on your phone? What? I only have his watch. I'm stuttering, Debbie. That wasn't stuttering. I was uh, I was just being polite. Girls go to the bathroom uh, together, but it's kind of weird if men go to the bathroom together. No, we go to the bathroom together. We just make sure that there's urinal in between us. You know what I mean? It's just a respect thing. Put a urinal in between you so that you can, you know, sort of talk while looking forward. You never want to sort of look over like, "Hey, how you doing?" You know, that's it's just one of those kind of respect things. Look straight forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Urinals are so weird. I have used so many rent men's restrooms when there's a long line in the ladies. Uh -huh. And I can't tell you how weird guys look at you when you come out of the stall and they're standing there peeing in a urinal. That, you know, you I've say, never given anybody a, an odd look. I, I only saw it at concerts and at, uh, and at like sporting events. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a concert where like two women walk by with you at the end and you're like, hey, how you doing? Long line. Yeah. Long line yeah, in the ladies know. room. I don't have that kind of time. I just did that in a restaurant and I came out of the stall and there was a really cute guy at the urinal. And I was like, can I look? I said, I've never done this where a guy was in here. Do you mind? And he was like, please leave. And I said, okay, let me just wash my hands. I wanted to get a, I want to know what that's like. I've never seen a man use a urinal. Uh, you're not missing much. You're not missing much. It's, uh, yeah. 
Why didn't uh, Reese go with her mom when she left the cult? Um, my mother I and I just weren't. An option. Yeah, we just weren't close. My mom didn't really know anything about my life. She didn't know what was going on. And she just, guys, you have to think about it that way. She hadn't been a part of it for so long. That's why even now, my mom and I are very close friends, but I wouldn't call my mother maternal. I wouldn't call my mother like super maternal, but she cares about me. We're best friends. I talk to her at least two times a day, but I've seen a man pee standing up, Kelly. I've just never seen him do it in a urinal and I found it fascinating. Yeah, it's a, it, I, could, I could see where it would be interesting. The uh, I used to stay in the bathroom talking about hair for an hour while Ted waited outside. Oh, that's just cold. <laughs> That is cold. Lacey, are all of your sisters out of Scientology now? I was the last one to leave. My sister left Scientology when she was 14. She went into the Sea Org at 14 and left. And um, she's she's been out since. So I was the longest. I stayed the longest. The guards do strip you down constantly. They really do. You spend a lot of time getting stripped up because... Right. That's the only way they can make sure you're not, you know, you're not smuggling things. You get stripped out in an average week. You probably get stripped out six times. I would say that's probably about it. And that's wow. in a regular prison. If you're, if you're in a lockdown unit, it's every day, really every day. All right. Going to the NASA is terrible. Yeah. You know what? It, it's, it's horrific for like three months, but it's like anything else in life. You know what I mean? In month four, the guy's doing it and you're going, yeah, did you watch that game last night? <laughs> you know, you're just yeah. having a conversation with the poor dude. Well, yeah, standing I mean, there. I could see that. I could see that. Uh, you know, it's it's just a it's just another everyday thing. You know, um, I really yeah, wanted day, to answer. Real. Lori had a question. How did your relationship begin with Huxley's dad? Huxley's dad was five years younger than me. He's the only man I've ever been with that was younger. I have two sisters. Um, that's a good question too, JD. Um. I met Huxley's dad when he was nine. So I've known him for a long, long time. And um, when I came back to the church and got back on lines, as what it's called, back on the bridge, um, that's how we got together. He was 19 years old. I think he was 18 years old, actually, at the time. Might have been 19, though. We got married when he was 19, I can tell you that. Um, JD, you had a good question, too. Reese, do you ever think of what you would say to your dad if you came face to face? The thing is, I saw him in 2019 in the Kansas City Ideal Org opening. That was the unveiling of the new building. He came for that. That was when I was dating Jeff and I brought Jeff with me. Um, I saw him for five hours total that I was there. We made eye contact. Um, he said hi to everybody around me. He never spoke to me, though. I mean, he made it very clear he didn't want anything to do with me. So I did not have the guts. I remember shaking when I saw him. So I did not have the guts to say anything to him. I thought about it because when I went to Clearwater, um, I thought, what if we see him? I might see him. I mean, he's down there all the time. If I saw him now, I definitely would have the guts. I don't feel afraid of him anymore. For the first time in my life, I don't feel afraid of him. Um, I would probably just... Um, I mean, I don't really want to tell you guys what I would say because it's, I'm not healed enough to say something that would be a good thing. I would probably tell him, um, oh, you good? I'm sorry. It's 110 in here. That wasn't enough. Um, no, no. You're not going to share fine. the details. Can you give uh, us no, the I, I would say to him, theme? I would, no one's going to like me for saying this, but I will tell you what I would say. I would probably go up to him and say, um, I absolutely hate you. I hate everything about you. And I look forward to the day that somebody calls and tells me you died. I hate you. And I, there's, I don't want to be a part of you anymore. There's a thousand and one people in here. I'll bet you not one of them has a problem with that. I'll put cash on that. There's not, not one person here that has a problem with that. I promise you. There's no one judging you for that. That makes absolute perfect sense. I mean, yeah, it's more than understandable. I'd be honest with you. If you had said anything other than that, I think I might've been a little freaked out. Yeah. But I think people would expect me to say like, Hey, I forgive you or something like that. I don't, I hate him. I absolutely hate him. I think he's, 
I honestly am so thankful, Tommy, because I have a child now. And I think I'm so glad that you had nothing to do with him, that he's not a part of your life. May I say something? I I like that, Mary, into the forever old man. I get phone calls. Um, I get phone calls and I get, I get text messages and I get emails from people who are trying to get over things that happened to them when they were young, right? It's part of the whole drug thing. It's a really, really big deal. And yeah, hell no is right. No forgiveness. This is what I'm getting at. And I'll get, I got an email from a, uh, from a woman who's trying to work through assault. The kind that is the, the, the that, you know, you, you say it on here, you get the, the demonetized, the Masterson kind of assault. And she said, you know, how in the name of God am I supposed to forgive a person like that? I said, you're not, right? You don't need to, you, and don't let anybody in society tell you that you're supposed to. The, the root of the word forgive, if you take it back to it, to the original form, literally means to give away, right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean to, you know, you're not saying, oh, you know what, Dad? Everything you've done, you're good. I'm not tripping at all. We're, we're good. We're on even ground. You know what you can do, though? You can give his ass away to something else. F you, you're not taking up another minute of my time. Give it away. Give it to, give it to whatever the universe is going to do. Karma, right? God, whatever you want to believe in, because guys like that, I promise you, in the afterlife, he's not going to be kicking it, you know, smoking cigars with L. Ron. Whatever the afterlife is, it does not treat things like that well, I assure you. I assure you. Anyone else's messages getting rejected? Maybe it's just that I don't like you, Calhoun. No, I'm kidding. That's I'm not, not nice. Uh, we love Calhoun. Um, um, yeah, I do still live boy. in Kansas City. Um, you still live in Kansas City? Somebody asked that. Do you still live in Kansas City? Yes. No, I knew you. I knew what you were. I was just. I was lamenting it. You say I was doing the. You still live in Kansas City. I, I, well, I, knew I don't want I to live lamenting. in Kansas City, honestly, guys. That's that's something that I think would help me with my growth and healing. I have no ties to Kansas City anymore. I have no family here. Um, I think it would be probably, Tommy, a really good thing for me to consider moving just to somewhere new um, and starting fresh because Kansas City does it's a little painful. I like it here, but I hate the winters. Like, you know, there's, I just don't have any ties. Um, it would be, I, I would like to start fresh somewhere. I think maybe I warmer. think that that's a great thing. And there's, and there's the answer. See, somebody said, how large a, uh, um, a super chat do you need for the six pack? Get her moved right when she's out of here. I'll do, uh, I'll do a week of it. No, I'm serious. I would love for you to, uh, I really would uh, look forward to um, to seeing you land somewhere um, warmer. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've reached the age where I now believe that if you live in some place that isn't warm all the time, then you just didn't get the memo, right? Cold sucks. It's no fun, right? I don't even like flying there anymore. I just, I'm sorry. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Huxley's dad lives in Kansas City as well, somebody asked. Esther says, hi, Florida could be a good option for Huxley, Huxley's sports career. See, they all know what's happening, right? Yeah. I, I, Florida is not a bad idea. Career. It's just a lot of people said Florida gets super like muggy and hot in the summer. And I Are don't you know. Are not but, a fan of humidity? I don't think I am. Arizona, the land of the zero humidity. Missouri we get, now. We get we get humidity like for a week a year. The dew point gets so high that it just dumps every bit of water all at once in a monsoon. Very, very cool. And then it goes back to being uh, exactly what it was the day before. That sounds cool. Somebody it said, does Huxley have lovely. a good relationship with his dad? Um he talks to his dad. It's, it's, um, it's kind of awkward. His dad has a whole horrible upbringing, um, in Scientology. He was super abused. So, um, his dad as an adult now has real anxiety problems functioning in society. Um, he really doesn't, uh, he doesn't do well. And I, I, I'm very close to his dad. I'm good friends. I've always been stayed friends with him, 
But I will tell you this, I never expect a lot out of him because I know the struggles he has mentally and he has a hard time taking care of himself. So I never expect him. I don't put a lot of pressure on him at all as Huxley's dad. I just tell him, do what you can. You know, you want to come see him, you come see him. But um, he really, really is struggling as an adult with anxiety and depression. And so I just do everything I can to help and tell him, you know, if you need me, I'm here. You always have a place to live. You know, um, I know what he went through and it's horrendous. It's awful. It really is. I'm sad that, that he went through that, but you're a pretty amazing person. You really are. I know I've, uh, I've got a few people that, uh, that I've divorced. They're not always that nice. And I'll be really honest. I'm usually pretty nice to them. For whatever reason. Doesn't Alan Ballantyne. Good to see you. Hey, Alan. I love Alan. So do I. He's my favorite people yeah. on planet Earth. Do you it's have, um, are there starred questions? Uh, yeah, there are probably a whole lot of them. Tucson is gorgeous seven months of the year. I'll give you eight. I think it's gorgeous eight months of the year. We have Sharon as a new member. Sharon, thank you. In great and green. Kathy loves horses. It's a great name. And who, what, where now? Reese, how did you get insurance to cover your composite veneer? They're beautiful. Yeah. And uh, thank you, babe. Well, thank you. So I'm not really sure what they, um, what the diagnosis was, but the, uh, see how that's like black it's healing. I had to have a, a gingivectomy. So I had my gum cut off yesterday. So that caused part of it. And then I had some, uh, like staining from something. And she said, insurance, they called, I have, must have a good plan. And she said, insurance will cover, um, almost all of it. So that's how, I don't know, but they wouldn't cover actual porcelain veneers. These are just composite veneers. Really? Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Mark Harmon. I, you know what? And, uh, I, you know, I almost outed Q's mom. I, I dropped the first half of her name the other day and I got yelled at, but Q's mom has never missed a lifeboat. So she's here. And I know that, uh, all the Q's are, uh, are meaning a lot. So I really appreciate you all. You're great. Um, I love Mark Hardman. He's so caring. You know, I just, I, everybody here, man, it's just a very, very solid group of people. Calhoun, I'm sorry. What am I doing? I'll touch nothing. I'm sorry. I'm usually not allowed to touch things because bad things happen. Tommy directs the internet. Kathy loves horses. Thank you. And better together. <laughs> Wait, your dad is the Gene Wally. Seriously, that guy is the worst. Wait a minute. Is she? Does she know who he is? I wonder. Is that what that I means? I would say that. Wait, your dad is the Gene Wally. Said, yeah, she knows who he now is. Now you spelled Wally. It's W A L L E Y. But yeah, that's e who he is. Um. Reese, honey, I'm so sorry. This breaks my heart. Your dad was wrong. Damn straight. You're a beautiful person inside and out. Oh, man. Are you kidding? Thank you, Grandma Sunshine. For yeah, being that's here. really but kind. Thank you, my I friend. I promise you, I don't need a thank you for doing this. I really do not. Alan Valentine, I love you, my brother. I really do. Um, you know, I was talking to Alan earlier today about the uh, about the cruise. I'm not going to lie to you. I was scaring Alan intentionally earlier today about why is that? What do you mean, scaring him? Because out? Alan is fun. Because Alan is fun to scare. He 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 reminds me a little a little of you in some ways. You know what I mean? Like he, uh, you'll you'll see. That is a handsome kitty. Look at that look. <laughs> She's really uh, pretty. Calhouni, not to be outdone. Um, for, uh. Brave Castro, thank you so much. And her two cats, thank you so much. Really appreciate you, Brave. And again, thank you. Snot face. Uh, seen her? No, but I know people who are in touch with her. So, um, or uh, yes, is the answer to your question. They got me to disconnect from my brother, father, and tried to make me disconnect from an old boyfriend. It's tough to talk about them. Love you both. We love you too. I'm so sorry. Disconnection. Right? Arwa. That's her name. Remember Arwa? I do. 
the uh, the disconnection thing, literally, right, is the exact opposite of um, the only thing that's keeping me alive and happy. Yeah. Right? My my mission in life is connection. Imagine how bad I hate this freaking cult. Huh? Anybody that teaches the, a concept called disconnection, they need to, they need to be gone. Plain and simple. <laughs> I can palm a bowling ball. I don't know if I can dribble one, but I can. Uh, I can most assuredly uh, pick one up. Um, the cat's name is Kid. That cat's name is Kid. This cat is named Squirrel. We have a cat cam. I don't know why I did that. I love uh, cats. Reese, you are truly an inspiration. Please never forget that I love you. Oh, thank you, Jam Jam. Guys, you are so supportive. Thank you. I felt lovely? safe and happy talking about my story tonight. I did not want it to get super emotional. I felt really comforted by you guys. So thank you, especially to you, Tommy. You know, I love you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it's a uh, it's a pretty incredible group of people. I'm just here to say I love you guys. My family lives overseas and I'm happy to have this family here. You know what? I'm so glad to hear that. I mean it. I'm so glad that you're here. But don't be uh, don't be shy. You know, um, especially if you have if your family is not with you, pop up. I mean, we're here a lot. We're here a lot. Thank you, mischief managed. God oh, bless. You love that cat, Yorkie Mama. You know what? I've never said hello to Yorkie Mama 65. I will put money on that. That's a name I have never said hello to. Hello and welcome to the lifeboat. That is awesome. That is awesome. You're bringing people with you, Reese. That's what it is. And Lord Kiss Freak, who has been a member since before there were members. I knew him before he was a lord. He was just Kiss Freak. Thank you so much, my, my friend. Boy, a lot of new ensigns. I can't begin to tell you um, how much it means to me that you come on here and do this. I know it's not easy to uh, to rehash things. And to all of the people who have um, sent me uh, emails or uh, texts, yes, I'm going to go on uh, Reese's uh, show and we're going to let her do uh, an interview. And um, when whenever she uh, uh, decides that we're going to do that, we're going to do that. But I don't know that we're done here. I, I still have like half a page of, of uh, are you questions. serious i i yeah but i didn't it's two and a half hours i didn't want to go longer than two and a half hours i thought you got all your questions out lordy you, okay you don't like me she looks upset no i'm sorry i'm done there, you know what i don't know how i did that no there there it is Please. no it's okay we can always do a third one i just i thought you got them all out no there is definitely one more we gotta do uh my tie to the church of region tommy <laughs> <laughs> oh you guys <laughs> oh wow no wonder your uh your uh stalker friend hates us yeah. she really does so, yeah. and you know we have just a nice healthy kind platonic relationship there's no reason whatsoever for you to be mean no right? there's not mean, mean people suck there's just no reason for that it's so true well, guys, part three is coming. It's going to have to, Kathy. And I promise it won't be as long as this one, but I want, um, there's a lot. Look, figure where we just stopped, right? Three part mini series. The three part mini series. Well, you got to get to where you met me, right? How did we get from where you just were to where you met me? That's what we got to get to. Well, you Pajama said Pixie. Clearwater. It wasn't Clearwater. Where did I meet you? In person, yeah, but we met way before that. We've been oh, talking. no, I know, but but that was where I got to where I got to throw the big hug on Reese and do the uh, the paw thing. That was so the, cute. Uh, I love thing. your little picture that you made of that. You know what? I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. We're the connection channel. I think that is such a great symbol of connection, and so many people come. Oh my on, god, on the it. ring it's thing. Insane. I was like, what's he oh, talking yeah. about the ring thing? Do you remember that comment? <laughs> Who said it? It was a wicked I can't funny remember. comment. But what it was two things. 
In the first 30 minutes, some it was. No, it said it said in the first five minutes, uh, you have uh, you've sniffed you've sniffed each other. You Tommy's oh, put a ring yeah. on your hand. You sniffed each <laughs> other, and Tommy put a ring on your finger. That's right. That's and right. There was something about my I think my jeans as well. I can't remember. Oh no, he, I uh, showed you my watch. I had. Uh, oh yeah, we saw the watch. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, every, everybody did. Yes. Ah, claim um, your destiny. What a nice thing to say. Oh, that's very nice. I love that. Shambot. Me too, Shambot. That. Yes. Guys, that. this is very real. We are we are all very close. This is not this means everything to me. So thank you for being here. I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Stray says I asked her to smell them. <laughs> I did sniff you. <laughs> yeah. Boy, there's just occasionally someone will say something that just really strikes me as funny. That's really funny. Tomorrow night, yeah? What time is your uh, quantum entanglement? I'm sorry. Tomorrow night I'll be on with uh, Miriam at 7. Miriam at 7. I'm going to be mm -hmm. there. I promise I am going well, to you, be you there. Well, you won't because that's what time the boat is. <laughs> No, oh, I got news too. So the boat is no longer going to be sailing on the fives. What? Just, Why? Because it isn't. Because so many people have asked that um, the boat go later. Uh oh. Uh, the vast Calhoun, don't get all excited now, you lazy, you know, see. No, th but truthfully, the vast majority, um, the vast majority of people who reached out said that they would love it uh, for it to be later, um, and I'm cool with that. So later, how much yeah. later? Probably right around two hours. So instead of being on the fives on Cali time, it would be on the sevens. Tommy, you got to think that through. You go to bed by eight o'clock. Well, the, the reason I do what I do is because of how the schedule runs and that will change if I change up how everything is going, but I will have a lot more people on it. I do get up really early, but I get up really early based on the fact that I do a five o'clock show. If I'm not doing a five o'clock show, I will get up as early. I promise you. Um, but I, don't I, love I, do that. Like I really worry about you getting enough sleep. I don't, honestly, I don't love that. Like this, the first thing I think of is you're going to not sleep as much and you with your, all your health yeah, stuff, you need to is. sleep. The idea is that uh, I want to sleep. Well, let's look at Calhoun. I will. I'll sleep more. A lazy kid. <laughs> no, you know what? Before I pick on uh, Spanky, Spanky's been working nonstop union for like four or five days. So I can't pick on him. See, so he puts his happy face up in the corner because he knows dad's. Right? That's the, that's the dad's happy head nods. You're, yeah. you're going to get more sleep. Watch. Would, see, Shelly says it too. I would actually get more sleep. I promise you that that's the case. And watch that how that changes case. your whole friggin' life, Dad. That's gonna like level you up. It's got nothing to do with you want to sleep in, does it, Calhoun? Because it does. It does oh, sound of like you're all not. No, no. Of course I'm not. I'm cool with it, Spanks. If he really does, weekend, right? Listen, if you really do, Tommy, get weekend. more sleep. Right. I will get it's sleep. really important to me that you get enough sleep. I worry about you not getting enough sleep. So if you really do get more sleep, then it's a good thing. But I'm yeah, concerned yeah. about and that. It, well, sleep is so also, important for you. Clocks really do. This, if the uh, the the uh, what do you call it? Uh, fall. What are we in? We're in spring. The spring forward thing. Uh, Mighty Unicorn daylight says, savings. Thank you. This is a thank you for this. It was very healing for me. I had a very difficult week dealing with my mother. She is. Uh, very triggering. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry to hear that, man. You know what? That family dynamics is always really tough. 7 a.m. is perfect, says Starfish. Well, that's what everybody's been saying, right? Um, yes, Spanx, Spanx is like a strawberry blonde, I would say. Um, the, uh, that's what they say. I think that cat is hungry. No, that's not. That hungry. is a pretty kitty. Isn't that's she cute? Kitty. I love this she, cat so much. She's a chonker. Kelly B says, I hate daylight savings. I don't play daylight savings. That's why I moved here. Done. Right? There's no daylight savings. That crap's going to happen. You guys go and play that game. I am done. There's no daylight savings for me ever again. Like shoveling snow. It's a thing of the past. So it's going to okay, be. So uh, when so does I'm that start? Doing... When is that starting? 
Um, I'm going to probably go uh, seven tomorrow morning. Which would be eight o'clock my time, right? Which would be, uh, yeah, eight o'clock your time. Kid that's is gonna mess up our, That's going to mess up our mornings. Oh, nonsense. Nonsense. So wait, wait. So you'll be like done by 930 my time. You know, honestly, everybody's going to, Tommy, I'll get more sleep because of this. Because you wake <laughs> me up in the morning. Everybody's so actually, gonna get more sleep. Uh, everybody's getting more sleep. Look, and they, this is funny because people said to me, well, "Why did you stand on the fives in the first place?" I said, "Because of all the people that had to go to work on the East Coast, I wanted to make sure they had a shot at doing a boat before they went to work." And then I realized that nobody, nobody goes to work. <laughs> nobody goes to work. Um, seriously, that's it's the actually, one. Actually, 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 though, yeah. Me, hey, hey, nobody. Yeah, that's me. ten a.m. East person. Coast. So, okay. So hold on. I got to think about this now. So I won't talk to you till like nine 30, 10 every morning. Okay. I guess I'll sleep in too then. Okay. But you know what? That means that I can, I can actually get up a little bit, a little bit. Um, uh, I can get up a little bit later in the day, which means um, a little bit more sleep. My, uh, I get up, I get up early. I do my, my, my uh, journaling. I do my, my, uh, Meditation, I work out, I do yoga, and then I'm ready to roll. Arizona does not change time, which is very cool because everybody's going to catch up and then I'm going to move it one more. It's going to be beautiful. But gonna, okay, it's like so I am going to be getting sleep when no one else does. So you will sleep later. You're not going to get up at like four or five anymore. You'll actually take oh, advantage. No, no. And, okay. No, I am absolutely going to be taking advantage of this. Okay. Okay. All right. I won't worry about you then. I worry about you all the time. Need a flow chart to make phone calls. Yeah, or something like that. It is Spanx dropping in. No, there's no updates on uh, Steve or Q, but I promise you if they come in. Uh, you're a yoga master? Wow. How awesome. You know, this is the saddest story. I went out. I wanted to put up a yoga video. I went out. We set up a, a tripod. I said, I'm only going to do this in one take. If it sucks, it sucks. I shoot the entire thing, right? And Johnny goes, dude, I, I cannot believe like you nailed that. It stopped filming at nine minutes. Some stupid oh. thing with his card. And there's no way I'll ever pull it out. Like it was perfect. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I've lost all desire to ever do it again. I'm so I believe it's angry. 10 Eastern. Miss Lady Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the seven right. on the on the um yeah, Pacific would be 10 in the east, too. Yeah. Okay. All right, peeps. What do you think? Will you will you stay on for a minute? I am going to After. stay on for a minute. I am okay. going to stay on for a minute. After. Wolfred Harry, thank you. Yeah, we'll just stay up a little bit later. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank Reese, you, guys. Thank you. Two Pleasure. and a half hours, baby. Right? Nothing to it. Nothing to it. We can go for only, a long time, me and you. Yeah. We yeah. can go for a long time. We can tend to. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Never gets old. Set records. All right, people. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, we'll guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> and...